Okay, so we ask for all of our witnesses to come to the witness table. That means that you're coming in front of your camera, you're turning it on, you're keeping yourselves mute. And you can see that that timer did pop out. We are popping that timer back in. So it will be coming back in. And we do believe that we will be starting on time today for our 1 p.m. Eastern time start. We will be able to update you with a little bit more information if that is not the case in the near future. All right, and we will be starting today at one o'clock. Remember, everything is going to be hot for those mics. So if you have any questions, shoot them to us. Keep yourselves muted the whole time. Turn off all the notifications on your devices. We will try to fix something if there's a disturbance of a non-muting member inside of the room. There's a lot of different tech people here for you. If you have any questions, shoot us something and we will have a tech person reach out to you. Everyone is here for you and we are going to go on a 90 second all quiet countdown and we are going on radio silent from here on out.
The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing to explore proposals to strengthen antitrust laws and restore competition online. Before I begin, I'd like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I would also like to remind all members that guidance from the Office of the Intending Physician states that face coverings are required for all meetings in an enclosed space, such as committee hearings. I expect all members on both sides of the aisle to wear a mask except when you are speaking. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Since June 2019, the Antitrust Subcommittee has conducted a bipartisan investigation into the state of competition and digital markets. From the beginning of this process, we promised to perform a top-to-bottom review, including an examination of the business practices and dominance of the largest tech firms, uh, technology platforms, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. Over the past 15 months, we've collected nearly 1.3 million internal documents and communications, a hearing record that totals 1,800 pages, testimony from 30 witnesses, submissions from more than 40 antitrust experts of every political persuasion, and interviews with more than 240 market participants, former employees of the investigated platforms, and other interested parties. Similar to prior congressional investigations, we did not set out with any preordained outcome in mind, and we have followed the facts. We've also worked to preserve bipartisan cooperation throughout this process. As my colleague and friend Ken Buck said before our last hearing, and I quote, this is the most bipartisan effort I've been involved with in five and a half years in Congress, end quote. Let us continue our work in the same spirit during today's hearing, the seventh and final hearing that we will hold to conclude the subcommittee's investigation. At our last hearing in July, we took the testimony of the chief executive officers of the four leading digital platforms, Jeff Bezos, Tim Cook, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sundar Pichai. For almost six hours, we pressed them for answers about their business practices, including about the evidence we uncovered that they have exploited entrenched and expanded their power in anti-competitive and abusive ways. To put it simply, their answers were evasive. They were non-responsive. And they raised new questions about whether they believe their companies are beyond oversight. These four corporations differ in important ways, but our investigation has identified three problems that each present. First, each platform now serves as a gatekeeper over a key channel of distribution. By controlling access to markets, these giants are able to pick winners and losers throughout our economy. Not only do they wield tremendous power, but they are also able to abuse it by charging exorbitant fees, imposing oppressive contracts, and extracting valuable personal data from the people and businesses that rely on them. Second, each platform uses their gatekeeper position to protect their own power. By controlling the infrastructure of the digital age, they have surveilled other businesses to identify potential rivals, and ultimately bought out, copied, or cut off their competitive threats. Third, these platforms have abused, and it seems will continue to abuse, their control to expand their power in the marketplace, whether it's through self-preferencing, predatory pricing, or requiring users to buy additional products The dominant platforms have used their power in destructive ways in order to grow even bigger. Each of these American companies have contributed immense technological breakthroughs and economic value to our country over the past several decades. They were founded on shoestring budgets in dorm rooms and garages and are a testament to our core values as, an economy, as a country. But in an effort to promote and continue this new economy, Congress and antitrust enforcers allow these firms to regulate themselves with little oversight. As a result, the internet has become highly concentrated, less open, and more hostile to innovation and entrepreneurship. To put it simply, these once scrappy underdogs, underdog startups have grown into the kinds of monopolies we last saw more than a century ago during the time of oil barons and railroad tycoons. We stand at a crossroads. There is no doubt about that. As part of this hearing, we will discuss paths forward for addressing these competition problems. Today's hearing also concerns broader questions about the overall rise of market power in our economy and potential solutions to arrest this concerning trend. In March, Subcommittee Ranking Member Sensenbrenner and I sent bipartisan requests for submissions from antitrust and competition policy experts with a diverse range of views on these matters. We requested comments on several questions as part of our review, 
including whether existing laws and enforcement levels are adequate to prohibit monopolization and anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions in today's economy. In response, we received 38 submissions from dozens of leading experts, including several of the witnesses testifying at today's hearing, which we have made public in connection with today's hearing. We are joined today by several leading experts in this field who will offer their thoughts on potential remedies for the problems that we have identified over the past 15 months. In closing, I thank our esteemed panel of witnesses for their testimony at today's hearing. And before I conclude, I just want to take a brief moment to recognize the outstanding career of the ranking member of the subcommittee, my friend and colleague, Jim Sensenbrenner. It has been a tremendous pleasure working with you, this Congress. As part of your distinguished career, you have left an indelible mark on this committee, on the United States Congress, and on our country. You have never hesitated to work across party lines in service of hardworking Americans, which is a quality that I hope endures on this subcommittee in your absence following your retirement from the Congress. As an incoming chairman, I look to you for leadership at the beginning of the Congress, and you have been a great source for advice and wisdom to me over the past two years. I thank you for your friendship and for your incredible service to this committee and to our country. And with that, it is my great privilege to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee for purposes of making his opening statement. Mr. Sensen. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your wonderful words. You know, looking back at 42 years, you know, I've tried my best in identifying issues, seeing where bipartisan agreement can be made, and then moving forward. And uh, during my chairmanship, we were tremendously productive on a bipartisan basis. And since then, I've kind of picked and choose my issues, and this has been one of them. This investigation has been very informative for us to better understand the tech ecosystem. When we began to process this process more than a year ago, I was very interested to learn about some of the country's largest and most successful companies. These companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple, are ubiquitous in today's America. <clears throat> but grasping their influence and size, and more importantly, what they do with that influence and size, was something that Congress needed to examine. The examination on the state of antitrust in the state tech world is wrapping up. We've heard from academics, enforcers, competitors, and notably the big four tech companies themselves. The record is extensive. So we find ourselves today hearing from a panel of witnesses who will tell us exactly what we should do about all of this. The size of this panel reflects the diverse opinions of what's to be done. At our last hearing, I don't believe we need to change the country's antitrust laws or abandon the consumer welfare standard. It has been my experience after 42 years in Congress that this body is ill-suited to micromanage the economy and probably even worse at predicting what it will look like in the future. I remain skeptical of proposals that break up these companies mandate a one-size-fits-all data standard, or create a government-run, quote, public option, unquote. It appears to me that this would ultimately stifle innovation and be more harmful to consumers. The question we should be answering is whether the law is inefficient to protect the consumer. I believe the American people have been well served by our antitrust framework for decades. By contrast, I don't think that overly burdened regulations that break up these companies or having the government insert itself in their operations is the right course of action. Where we need to see improvement is in the enforcement of existing law. However, it should be noted that enforcement is starting to work. For more than a year, the DOJ and FTC have been conducting their own antitrust investigations into the big tech companies. It is being reported that as a result of this investigation, DOJ is readying a case against Google. Let us keep in mind as we consider whether a drastic overhaul of antitrust is warranted to meet the goals of the consumer welfare standard. I do want to take a moment to thank Chairman Cicilline for the courtesies that he's extended to me during this process as an effort to keep this investigation bipartisan. I do truly believe that the friendship we've developed, and while we ultimately disagree on the future of antitrust laws and the tech companies, I can say that it has been a pleasure to know you and to work with you on this. 
I also want the record to reflect that the next time we go to dinner, it is Chairman Cicilline's turn to buy, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. I now recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. It has been a pleasure to take part in this historic and bipartisan process. As we approach the final months of this session, I want to take a moment to reflect on the subcommittee's substantial efforts during this Congress. The subcommittee has taken a number of concrete steps forward in support of its critical mission to promote open and fair markets for the American people. With an appropriate focus on consumers and workers, as well as small and medium-sized businesses who are struggling to stay afloat. During the 116th Congress, we have favorably reported out of the Judiciary Committee nearly a dozen bipartisan bills developed by the Antitrust Subcommittee, all of which passed with unanimous support. These include a bipartisan package of bills that ban various types of anti-competitive conduct by branded drug companies, which are vital to stop the skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs. We were able to enact one of these bills, the CREATES Act, into law last year. This act, which was sponsored by Subcommittee Chairman Cicilline and Senator Patrick Leahy, will cut drug prices by billions of dollars by removing entry barriers for generic competitors. Over the past year, we have also enacted several other important laws that originated with the subcommittee, including laws to ensure that small businesses, veterans, and consumers have access to a fresh start through the bankruptcy system. This work is more important than ever as our nation continues to grapple with the devastating economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We also passed out of the House for the very first time the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal Act, or the FAIR Act, which restores the rights of every American and small business to their day in court by ending forced arbitration. This important legislation was championed by Courts and Intellectual Property Subcommittee Chairman Johnson. Just two days ago, the Judiciary Committee voted out, voted out a bill that I sponsored to help address a student loan debt crisis. That legislation makes student loan debt dischargeable in bankruptcy, fixing a great injustice that burdens millions of Americans. I am deeply proud of these efforts, and I look forward to continuing our work towards enacting laws that will promote competition, access to the courts, and a fair bankruptcy process, among the subcommittee's other important work. Turning to today's hearing, over the past 15 months, the Antitrust Subcommittee has undertaken a historic bipartisan investigation of competition in the digital marketplace. As I made clear at the subcommittee's last hearing, I had significant concerns about consolidation and its harmful effects. The investigational record bore this out. Each of the major companies that were part of this investigation, in its own way, exerts dominant control in the digital marketplace that is caused for great concern. As we approach the end of this investigation, with the benefit of our six hearings and substantial record, my belief that we must modernize and reinvigorate enforcement of the antitrust laws is stronger than ever. We must modernize our antitrust laws to meet the challenges of our modern economy. And we must ensure that our enforcement agencies have the tools, resources, and the will to vigorously enforce the law to protect consumers and promote competition. This investigation has also made clear to me that beyond fixing the antitrust laws, we must use our oversight authority to shore up the antitrust enforcement agency's ability and will to enforce those laws. In some instances, the lack of enforcement may come down to a lack of will. Our antitrust enforcers should not pull punches. We must ensure that the leadership at these agencies is committed to robust enforcement. It is also important to adequately staff and resource the agencies as antitrust cases have become more resource intensive and agency staff is faced with investigating some of the wealthiest companies of all time. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and to discussing how we can work together on these important matters going forward. I thank the chairman for holding this hearing and for his leadership of this important investigation. I also want to thank the ranking member, Mr. Sensenbrenner, the chairman emeritus of the full committee for his many years of service to this committee and to the House. He will be sorely missed next Congress. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, and I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Big tech is out to get conservatives. That's not a suspicion. That's not a hunch. It's a fact. I said that two months ago at our last hearing. It's every bit as true today. Democrats have said 
that they want to take a serious look at the size, power, and influence of these companies, but they've refused our repeated request that this include an evaluation of how platforms are censoring speech. Maybe it's because the left isn't being censored. We never hear about Mother Jones being demonetized. We don't hear about Young Turks videos being taken down. We don't hear about the Daily Coast being censored. Nope, this only happens to conservatives. Google tried to demonetize the Federalist. Amazon censors the Family Research Council. YouTube blocks videos from Senator Blackburn. Twitter, Twitter censors the president, but they let the leader of Iran post a statement where it talked where he says they will strike a blow against American citizens. The last hearing, our concerns were dismissed as, quote, conspiracy theories, despite this mounting evidence of biased actions against conservatives. Even though you are seeking to radically rewrite antitrust laws, Silicon Valley continues to use its power to carry your water. In fact, the vast majority of political contributions from the very firms you are targeting go to Democrats. You've even denied Republicans, and more importantly, the American people, the opportunity to hear from Twitter at the last hearing held by this subcommittee. Twitter, I'll remind you, banned four, shadow banned four members of Congress. 435 in the House, 100 in the Senate, 535, four. Only four. Four conservative Republicans get shadow banned by Twitter, but when we asked you to bring them in, you said, nope, can't do that. A root cause of big tech censoring conservatives lies with the defects in how the law governing liability online has been applied and interpreted. Rather than stimulate an open debate and free exchange of ideas, Section 230, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has given license to platforms to target particular viewpoints, particularly, as I pointed out, those of conservatives. In fact, the otherwise objectionable, quote, otherwise objectionable provision has been abused by the platforms as a catch-all term used to discriminate against any content they find disagreeable. Congress has an obligation to ensure that the rules in place governing accountability online and providing protections for the moderation of content are applied fairly and without undue bias against certain ideologies. Today, a dozen Republican members of this committee introduced legislation to update laws governing the liability platforms could face when they insert their own opinionated editorial decisions into what content stays up and what content comes down. Our bill amends uh, Communications Decency Act 230 to provide needed clarifications and transparent rules of the road. Importantly, we replace the vague, otherwise objectionable category with the narrowly tailored categories and make clear that decisions to remove or restrict content are immune from liability only, only in certain specific instances that reasons for these editorial decisions must be made on an objectively reasonable basis not the subjective standard that is in current law. The legislation also makes clear that decisions to remove content must actually be done in good faith based on predictable criteria. Under the new law, platforms would be required to have publicly available terms of service that state plainly how content moderation decisions are being made. And if content is taken down, the platform now must supply the provider of that content with notice explaining the basis for restricting the censorship and provide them with an opportunity to respond. This is common sense reform, and I hope, I hope, as the ranking member mentioned, I hope we can move on in a bipartisan fascist uh, basis. Free speech should not be a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a matter at the very heart of our democracy, and I look forward to today's discussion. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing, and I too want to thank ranking member Sensenbrenner, former chairman Sensenbrenner, for his decades of work in the United States Congress for the American people. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's witnesses. Our first witness is Bill Baer. Mr. Baer is a visiting fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. He is the only person to have led antitrust enforcement at both U.S. antitrust agencies as both assistant attorney general from 2013 to 2016 and director of the Bureau of Competition at the Federal Trade Commission from 1995 to 1999. Mr. Bayer is, was twice named the best competition lawyer in the world by the Global Competition Review by the National Law Journal as one of the decade's most influential lawyers. He received the FTC's Miles W. Kirkpatrick Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015. Mr. Bayer 
received his BA from Lawrence University and his JD from Stanford Law School, where he served as senior article editor of the Stanford Law Review. Our second witness is Zephyr Teachout. Uh, she is an associate professor of law at Fordham University. Professor Teachout is an expert on antitrust, election, and constitutional law. She was the first director of the Sunlight Foundation and serves on the board of the Open Markets Institute. She has written dozens of law review articles and two books, including Corruption in America, from Ben Franklin's Snuffbox to Citizens United. Professor Teachout received her BA from Yale University and her JD from Duke Law School. Our third witness is Michael Cadis, the Director of Markets and Competition Policy at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Prior to joining the Equitable Growth, Mr. Cadis served as an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission for 20 years. During his time at the commission, he was also an attorney advisor to Chairman John Leibowitz and the Tr Deputy Trial Counsel. Mr. Cadis is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Wisconsin Law School. Sabil Rahman, our fourth witness, is the president of Demos. Demos is a group dedicated to fighting for a just, inclusive, multiracial democracy. Mr. Rahman is also an associate professor of law at Brooklyn Law School. His writings on democracy, economic power, and inequality have been published in The Atlantic, The New Republic, The Boston Review, Dissent, and The Washington Post. His first book, Democracy Against Domination, won the Dahl Prize for scholarship on the subject of democracy. Professor Rahman received his master's degree from the University of Oxford and both his law and doctorate from Harvard University. The fifth witness at our hearing today is Christopher Yu, Professor of Law, Communication, Computer, and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He is a frequently cited scholar in administrative and regulatory law with his primary research focusing on ways to connect more people to the internet, the internet's rooting architecture and network neutrality. He's written more than 100 scholarly works and regularly testifies before Congress, the FCC, the FTC, and the Department of Justice. Professor Yu received his AB from Harvard University and his JD from Northwestern Law School. Rachel Bovard, our sixth witness, is the Senior Director of Policy at the Conservative Policy Institute. She has more than 10 years of experience working in policy in Washington, D.C. In 2006, she served as Senator Rand Paul's legislative director. She went on to work on the Senate Steering Committee under both Senator Pat Toomey and Senator Mike Lee as policy director. She has also served as Director of Public Serv Policy Services for the Heritage Foundation, and in 2013, she was named one of the National Journal's Most Influential Women in Washington Under 35. Ms. Bovard received her BA from Grove City College and her master's from George Washington University. Our seventh witness, Tad Lipsky, is the assistant professor and director of the Competition Advocacy Program at the Global Antitrust Institute at Antone Scalia Law School. Prior to joining the Global Antitrust Institute, Professor Lipsky served as acting director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition from February 2017 to July 2017. Over his storied career in antitrust law, Professor Lipsky has served as the Coca-Cola Company's chief antitrust lawyer, the first international officer of the American Bar Association's section of antitrust law, and as the co-chair of the International Competition Policy Working Group of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Professor Lipsky received his master's and JD from Stanford University. Our last witness, Sally Hubbard, is the Director of Enforcement Strategy at the Open Markets Institute. Prior to her time with Open Markets, Ms. Hubbard was the Senior Editor of Antitrust Enforcement and Regulation of Tech Platforms at the Capitol Forum. She has also spent seven years as the Assistant Attorney General at the New York State Office of the Attorney General's Antitrust Bureau. Ms. Hubbard earned her Bachelor of Arts at the College of William & Mary and her JD at New York University School of Law. So as you can see, we have a very, um, distinguished panel, and we're grateful for their presence today. We welcome all of you, and thank you for your participation. And I will begin by swearing in our witnesses, and I ask our witnesses uh, testifying in person to rise, and I ask our witnesses testifying remotely to turn on their audio and make sure I can see your face and your raised hand while I administer the oath. Do each of you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you God? Thank you. Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you all. You may be seated. Uh, please note that your written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Uh, to help you stay within that time, there's a timing light in uh, WebEx as well as uh, before you. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. 
I would also remind you that you are the only ones from your respective companies invited to testify today in accordance with normal House practice and Section G of the House Remote Committee's preceding regulations. I will assume that your sworn testimony is your own. Uh, please let me know if at any point in the hearing you wish to mute yourself so you can confer uh, with your counsel or other individuals. Uh, Mr. Barrow, you may begin. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Cicilline, Chairman Adler, Ranking Members Sensenbrenner and, and Jordan. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today and thank you for the courage and tenacity this subcommittee has shown in tackling the role of antitrust law in the 21st century. I bring the perspective of someone who, uh, uh, who has been privileged to serve on the front lines of antitrust enforcement in four different administrations twice at the FTC and most recently as head of antitrust at the Department of Justice. That experience teaches me that in many cases our antitrust laws have been successful and forces for good. But too often antitrust jurisprudence has, has fallen short and failed to protect consumers and competition as, as much as it can and as it should. My submission makes four basic points. Antitrust enforcement does need to be based on an analytically sound, fact-based framework. But we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And many courts have held enforcement to an effective standard of proof that is unrealistic and inconsistent with the plain language of our antitrust statutes. If the courts are unwilling to step back from this overreach, legislation may well be needed to reset the balance. And finally, I do believe more resources are needed if antitrust enforcement is to fulfill its role as the economic cop on the beat. Now, I was on the scene in the 70s uh, as the Chicago School came to narrow dramatically the focus of antitrust, mostly to price fixing and a few mergers to monopoly or near monopoly. The Chicago School, as former FTC chair Bob Atomsky put it, really overshot the mark. We went from a place in the 1960s when Supreme Court Justice Stewart complained that the only consistency he could find in Supreme Court antitrust decisions was that the government always wins. We went from there to a 25-year dark age where the government invariably lost. Now, we moved the needle somewhat in the 90s, uh, uh, convincing the courts to block uh, uh, merger consolidations, office supply superstores, drug wholesalers, and to sustain efforts by the government to challenge behavior by Microsoft and Toys R Us that limited competitive opportunities for rivals. These modest successes have continued over the last couple of decades, as some courts have recognized the anti-competitive impact of hospital consolidation and uh, uh, anti-competitive agreements pay for delay understandings between generic manufacturers and brand names. But looking back at the cases where the government prevailed in the last couple of decades helps explain why concentration and market power have actually increased. Invariably, with a government won an antitrust challenge, the government's evidence was overwhelming. Mergers to monopoly or near monopoly and transparently bad conduct by dominant firms. In close cases, the government typically lost or enforcers never brought the case in the first place out of fear that the courts would rule against and make more bad law. How did we get there? In my view, the fear of getting it wrong warped antitrust enforcement. Antitrust jurisprudence today is too cautious, too worried about the effects of over-enforcement, what they call the social sciences type one errors. Bias against enforcement has caused many courts to demand a level of proof that is often unattainable, that chills enforcement, limits our ability to challenge conduct or acquisitions of potential ri rivals, especially in the tech sector, where firms benefiting from network effects can acquire enduring market power. So what do I think we should do about it? I think we need to modify current law to, rec to direct the courts and antitrust enforcers to be more assertive in challenging conduct and consolidation that risk creating or enhancing market power. Modest changes will suffice by incorporating presumptions that certain behaviors are, are likely to reduce competition, making it clear that showing a risk of reduction in competition is sufficient. 
emphasizing that anti-competitive effects include price and quality and innovation competition, and legislating to overrule recent problematic court decisions. Congress can make a meaningful difference, and we need to consider forward-looking rules and legislation that will enhance competition. We have precedent for that. The 2004 FCC rule allowing consumers to port their phone numbers to competing carriers gave consumers the economic power to reward those with lower prices and better service. It forced incumbent carriers to compete like never before. Those sorts of tools, portability, interoperability, can help restore markets to a competitive equilibrium. Congress also needs to fund antitrust enforcement. Today we spend about 18% less than we did 10 years ago, despite increasing concentration, a growing number of dominant firms, and a much, much larger economy. We need funding both to bring enforcement actions and to allow for after-action studies of what happened in markets where the agencies decided not to bring enforcement actions or where the courts rejected an antitrust challenge. We can do more and we can do better. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. And I recognize Professor Teachup for five minutes. Could you please turn on your microphone? Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this historic hearing. My expertise is in the law of democracy, so I will speak to the essential nature of what you are doing to protect our democracy. Antitrust laws and strong antitrust laws are essential for freedom and for a thriving economy. The highly concentrated big tech marketplaces and the existing abuses of big tech enabled by their dominant positions poses a major democratic threat. It is quintessentially a congressional job to respond to this threat. For nearly 40 years, the Supreme Court, not Congress, has been the primary institution rewriting American antitrust laws. The court is detached from the realities of business and power, unaccountable to the public, and Congress has essentially allowed them to take the reins, gutting popular laws with their own judge-made theories and allowing this massive growth of concentrated power. This has to change. Congress, not the Supreme Court, must be the body responsible for defining the scope of those laws. The Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, and our other antitrust laws are not constitutional provisions over which Congress must defer interpretations to the court. They are federal laws passed by this body. And when they are misinterpreted by courts, Congress must, must act. There are several particular cases that I and others highlight in my written submission that are ripe for direct congressional overturning. But it is not sufficient to pick a handful of cases, this body must recognize its central role uh, in making economic policy and play an ongoing role in the kind of investigations that it has just in, it conducted, overseeing agencies, and continually re-examining antitrust laws. Senator Phil Hart went to his deathbed working on antitrust legislation. Up until the 1980s, this body understood that economic policy and anti-corruption policy require, required ongoing anti-monopoly vigilance. Second, it will not be sufficient to overturn those laws. Significant new legislation is required as your uh, investigation revealed. Key parts of big tech companies have become a kind of essential public infrastructure. The economy and public life would come crashing to a halt if they were suddenly removed. No merchant, politician, political activist, or journalist can thrive without them, and few individuals can. They play a grossly outsized role in the basic functions of our, our society and have become unelected, unaccountable, and self-serving heads 
of planned economies planned by them. This is deeply problematic infrastructure because they are riven with conflicts of interest. They own platforms and compete on the platforms. So Congress should pass a law, um, people often talk about this in terms of structural separation, delineating single line of business rules for the very biggest tech companies. This single line of business rule uh, uh, kind of law exists throughout our nation's history and it would lead to things like Amazon, for instance, being prohibited from being involved in fulfillment or shipping a distinct line of business. Uh, Facebook could not also uh, be engaged in Facebook Messenger. Uh, Google should not be owning YouTube. Finally, I want to applaud this subcommittee for a riveting and critically important investigation and, and argue that Congress must continue with this kind of investigation, not just this committee. This should be the beginning of the golden age of congressional investigations where committees use their investigative power to reveal abuses and address them. As big, dig, big tech companies become more powerful, they are building direct political power. Big tech, as you know, is the biggest lobbyist in DC. And Congress must stand up to these new robber barons to protect our public institutions, to restore democratic and economic freedoms, and build a thriving, fair, and free country. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tichon. I now recognize Mr. Cadiz for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, Full Committee Chairman Nadler, Full Committee Ranking Member Jordan, and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify you on, to you on this important issue. And I would like to share um, the commendations that uh, my colleague Bill Baer, who also gave me my first promotion, um, probably his biggest mistake, um, that this committee really needs to be commended for taking on this topic proceeding despite political, the, the, the politics in a bipartisan way. Um, and it's a really testament to the, to, the, to the strength of this nation and, and democracy. The challenges we face are not limited to one or two companies. The filing of one or two cases are, will not solve problems in digital marketplaces. This committee has an ongoing important role in promoting competition in digital markets. And so, there are three issues I urge you to consider as, as the committee moves forward. First, we need legislative reform, not just enforcement actions. Over the past 40 years, showing an almost neurotic fear of over-enforcement, the courts have increased the burdens on plaintiffs and narrowed the scope of the antitrust laws. Both economic research and empirical resu results discredit that approach. As the letter I, along with 11 other economists and lawyers submitted to this committee concludes, the antitrust laws as interpreted and enforced today unnecessarily limit the ability to address the anti-competitive conduct in digital marketplaces that the committee has investigated. So for example, under current case law, it is, arguably, it is arguable that the government could not have successfully pursued its claim that led to the breakup of the, American, the at and phone monopoly in the 80s, perhaps the most significant monopolization case in the history of the US and maybe the world. Something is simply wrong when judicial decisions implicitly undermine basic competition principles. Just yesterday, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals found that the Federal Trade Commission is powerless to punish monopolists. Despite agreeing that a defendant in the case, a branded manuf pharmaceutical manufacturer, had violated the FTC Act and delayed lower cost generic competition, the court blithely concluded that the FTC could not obtain an, an injunction to stop the conduct in the future, nor could it recover the nearly half a billion dollars that the company earned by violating the law. Again, something is wrong when the courts decide there are no repercussions for violating the antitrust laws. We, now, we know how the courts are interpreting the antitrust laws, but as, as Professor Teachout just mentioned, it's up to Congress to decide whether that's correct. But unless Congress acts, it is accepting the judicial view that the antitrust laws have little power to stop or deter anti-competitive conduct, whether it be in the pharmaceutical industry, digital markets, or anywhere else in the economy. 
Two bills introduced by Senator Amy Klobuchar, the Anti-Competitive Exclusionary Conduct Prevention Act and the Consolidation Prevention and Competition Promotion Act embody reforms that would allow Congress to restore the strength of the antitrust laws. None of this is to suggest that the government should get a pass from prosecuting antitrust violations against digital platforms. To the contrary, antitrust enforcers have a duty to attack monopoly power where they find it, despite these challenges. This leads me to my second point. A key remedy in an antitrust case involving digital platforms needs to be to under, once a violation has occurred, the remedy needs to eliminate the network effects that create entry barriers. And I talk about this more fully in my statement. Um, but that means when we think about remedy, prohibiting conduct, penalizing the companies, even breaking them up, all may not be sufficient to restore competition. So that's the challenge the enforcers will have going forward. Finally, I want to commend also this, the committee for thinking broadly about solving competition. This is not just about competition, antitrust enforcement, or regulation. We need both tools, as my colleague Sally Hubbard reminds me often. Um, so this committee is correct to be considering both regulatory tools as part of that solution. Protecting competition in digital marketplaces requires that the laws efficiently distinguish between pro and anti-competitive conduct, that remedies deal with the underlying structural problems causing the anti-competitive activity, and a combination of antitrust enforcement and regulation so that markets deliver the results that benefit us all. Um, and I have nine sections. I just want to say, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, one of my favorite things was as I would drive to clerk for Judge Reynolds back in the early 90s through your district, and I would complain about the traffic. He would always explain to me, we don't complain about that traffic because we like James Sensenbrenner even when we don't agree with him. So I thought this was an appropriate time to share that story with you. Thank you, Mr. Kadis. I now recognize Professor Rahman for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the subcommittee and the full committee. I'm grateful for this opportunity to participate in this hearing with you all on this critical issue of reinvigorating our competition policy in the online economy. Uh, as president of Demos, we're focused very much on this idea of how we build an inclusive and equitable democracy and economy. And the work of this subcommittee is critical to that vision. Tech platforms are our modern infrastructure, like roads, bridges, telecom, and that poses unique regulatory and policy challenges that this committee and its recommendations will have to consider. In short, as some of our colleagues have already mentioned, we will have to engage both uh, structural tools to break up as well as regulatory tools, and I'll talk about that in these next few minutes. So if we think about the physical infrastructure of our uh, no ordinary life, roads, telecom, bridges, electric utilities, there are some basic rules of the road that we need for that to actually serve the goals of economic innovation, uh, serving consumers and communities, and ensuring that all of us are able to benefit in the uh, uh, growth of our economy. We need to make sure that these infrastructures can, don't discriminate on basis of price, on basis of race. We need to ensure that they don't self-deal, the kinds of conflicts of interest that Professor Teachout mentioned are a big problem. We also need to make sure that our basic infrastructure isn't toxic, right? We wouldn't want people who drive on the roads to then get sick from driving on those roads. And we want to make sure that they don't entrench themselves, that the fact that one highway exists doesn't mean that uh, we can't build another faster highway that takes us, that shortens time on the route. These are the kinds of challenges that we actually face in the digital environment. So let me give two uh, quick examples highlighted by the work of this subcommittee. If we take Amazon, for example, We've seen in the hearings of this uh, subcommittee over these last few months how Amazon has leveraged its dominance over online retail transactions to undercut its competitors, to engage in predatory pricing, and to stifle innovation. This impact is not just on the economy and on growth. It is also a particularly hard felt impact on black, brown, indigenous communities when you think about the impacts on small businesses, for example. That market dominance has then in turn also enabled Amazon to uh, pressure state and local governments for more uh, favorable regulatory treatment and subsidies, uh, and to avoid the kinds of uh, uh, liabilities for its workplace safety, particularly at a time where we see black and brown essential workers uh, facing astronomically high injury rates, double the industry average, uh, and where, where Amazon warehouses have themselves become hotspots for COVID transmission. Facebook offers another example. With the election rapidly approaching, we've seen the dangers of an ad-based data mining based business model where an online information platform like Facebook 
uses algorithms that maximize user attention in order to sell targeted ads. That essentially means that our information infrastructure of Facebook is actually incentivized to allow the rapid spread of toxic misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, uh, attacks on black and brown uh, speakers in particular. Here too, we see the burden is felt disproportionately on black and brown communities. The policy response to this type of problem has to grapple with the fact that we need, in some ways, we want infrastructure to enable communication, to enable new innovation. That infrastructure has to serve all of us, has to serve the economy as a whole, rather than being a basis for the kind of entrenchment uh, that Professor Teachout mentioned. So I want to suggest in these last uh, minute and a half briefly some of the policy strategies that this committee should consider. First, we need to include structural separations and breakups as part of the policy toolkit. Congress can legislate standards to this effect, can also uh, reinvigorate the enforcement powers of agencies like the FTC to pursue the kinds of functional separations, line of business separations that will be important. <laughs> Second, we need to complement breakups and structural separations with regulatory standards and public standards uh, that enforce those basic rules of the road for our digital infrastructure. That means standards for non-discrimination, for portability, uh, labor and consumer protection standards, basic, basic rules of the road that we see in all other parts of the economy that we need to bring to the digital space. Third, there might be instances where we might want public provision, as has been mentioned already, uh, in order to ensure fair and equal access and to provide the kind of competitive pressure that is sometimes lacking uh, in these markets. These are all familiar and doable policies. They are, in fact, common in our history and our tradition, going back a century ago and over the years. And in fact, the use of these tools has enabled the kinds of innovation and dynamism that has brought the, the gains of many of these last few decades of economic growth. As my time is winding down, I'll just note that these policies, these strategies, are essential to rebuilding our economy in this moment of crisis. Uh, we'll be need, th these policies will be essential as we move forward out of the current crisis that we're in. Thank you very much, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Professor Arman, and I now recognize Professor Yu for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Subcommittee Member Sensenbrenner, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, and the members of the subcommittee. I applaud the subcommittee for its review of how antitrust law should apply to digital markets. In sifting through the various reform proposals before you, I would encourage the subcommittee to keep in mind three key principles. The first is the importance of maintaining antitrust longstanding commitment to protecting consumers over competitors. The second is the key role played by innovation and the importance of flexibility in promoting innovation. And the third is that many remedies work far worse in practice than they sound in theory. I'll explore these three themes by examining two of the proposed reforms which have already come up today, uh, restricting companies to a single line of business and mandating portability and interoperability. Beginning first with line of business restrictions, there is strong evidence that proposals to prevent companies from entering complementary lines of business would likely harm consumers. The reality is that all companies do more than one thing and consumers typically benefit. And to, to cite one specific example, my colleague Herbert Hovenkamp has noted that Allowing Amazon to sell private label products has provided enormous consumer benefits by allowing them to pay lower prices. In addition, we've seen Amazon expand from just an e-commerce platform into cloud computing and other uh, aspects that have been tremendously beneficial. If you look at the surveys of the literature on vertical integration conducted by antitrust anti enforcement officials from both parties, those surveys confirm that although the theoretical studies hypothesize ways that vertical integration could harm consumers, the real world, world data indicate that it is much more likely to benefit consumers. These results underscore the importance of assessing consumer welfare based on system, systematic real world evidence and not abstract theoretical possibilities or anecdotes. Um, restricting companies to a single line of business can also harm innovation. For example, in 2005, uh, U.S. mobile operating systems were a sleepy market dominated by Palm, BlackBerry, Symbian, and Microsoft. Apple iOS appeared in 2007, and then uh, Android followed in 2008, and these new entrants employed innovative new business models based on vertical integration and third-party payments that reduced direct costs by consumers that went beyond the original lines of business of just simply mobile operating systems. 
In so doing, these new entrants unleash the smartphone revolution that has provided tremendous benefits for consumers. Uh, this history provides useful examples of how consumers benefit when companies have the breathing room to experiment with different approaches and uh, uh, contrary rules would risk ruling particular business models out of bounds. If so, the case-by-case -case approach of traditional antitrust is better suited to promoting innovation than would anti ex ante prohibitions. This is particularly important in dynamic industries where technological change frequently renders particular verbal formulations of ex ante rules obsolete. Now, regarding data portability and interoperability, another common, uh, an interesting problem is that large platforms such as Google and Facebook already provide for data portability, uh, and yet consumers almost never avail themselves of this feature. Understanding why it requires a deeper appreciation of what mandating data portability and interoperability actually requires. Uh, for data portability and interoperability to be meaningful, the data must be in a standardized format. To do otherwise would like to be trying to fit the proverbial square peg into the round hole. The reality is, is that different companies uh, structure their data in radically different ways, and reconfiguring data is prohibitively expensive. Therefore, mandating data portability and interoperability imposes in standardization costs and has the unfortunate effect of picking winners and losers. As ranking member Sensenbrenner noted, the result would be to force data into a one size fits all approach. In addition, interoperability can be only imposed under certain circumstances. We learned uh, over time that it works when interfaces are relatively simple, they're easy to monitor and require little information. The type of data interfaces we're talking about uh, in this series of proceedings seem to represent a complex interface that has not historically been amenable to mandated interoperability. And importantly, data formats are tied directly to innovation. The structure of data determines what types of uses are and are not possible. Forcing data into a particular format would inevitably preclude certain types of important innovation. Uh, together, these considerations suggest that seemingly simple remedies are going likely to prove hard to implement and create cons hidden consumer harms in terms of cost and loss of innovation, and that the traditional case-by-case -case approach, fact-intensive and uh, specific, uh, should be more beneficial. In closing, I would like to emphasize that it is tempting to ask antitrust to provide uh, to serve a wide range of goals beyond its traditional role in protecting competition. Uh, while there are many important roles, any asking anyone law to do too much risks causing it to be ineffective at doing nothing. I believe U.S. citizens would be best served if antitrust continues to retain its traditional focus on promoting uh, consumer welfare and competition in markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yu. I now recognize Ms. Bovard for five minutes. Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, Chairman Nadler, and Ranking Member Jordan, thank you for inviting me to testify today. A growing bipartisan consensus is emerging against the power of the big tech companies. This consensus is based on the recognition that corporate hegemony, that is, concentrated power exercised at scale, can be a threat to individual liberty, the free market, and independent thought in a free society. To that end, I started the Internet Accountability Project in 2019 to give a voice to conservatives concerned about the growing concentrated power of big tech as it is exercised and weaponized at unprecedented levels. IAP has focused its efforts on three areas of policy remedy, antitrust enforcement, data privacy and ownership, and reform of Section 230, which one pro-tech law professor has identified as big tech's implicit financial subsidy. That big tech systematically engages in viewpoint and information bias is increasingly obvious. Here are a few recent examples. Dr. Scott Atlas, a neuroradiologist and professor at Stanford Medical School, has been accused of spreading medical misinformation by Google's YouTube, but only after he joined the White House's coronavirus task force. A deep investigation into Google by the Wall Street Journal found that the company, quote, made algorithmic changes to its search results that favor big businesses over small ones, end quote. The investigation also found that Google modified its search results around topics like abortion and immigration. In June, Google colluded with NBC News to flex its muscles against the conservative news site, The Federalist, for minor violations of its ad policies in their comments section. In July, the search engine inexplicably stopped presenting search results for several leading conservative websites. 
Conservatives are routinely told that bias is a myth, but that assertion is unprovable because these tech companies are not at all transparent about their algorithmic and content moderation practices. But they should be. These decisions have profound impact on the nature of free thought and expression when done at a scale at which these companies exist. A single algorithmic decision made by individuals in a private corporation, accountable to no one, changes what kind of viewpoints and information are available to billions of people around the world. Antitrust enforcement, the subject of this committee's remit, is equipped to tackle corporate hegemony. It is the view of myself and the Internet Accountability Project that our antitrust laws do not need to be updated, that the laws on the books are sufficient for tackling per se violations of antitrust as they exist in the tech sector. Antitrust enforcement is not regulation. It is law enforcement. As conservatives, we do not support legal amnesty for those who violate our nation's laws, and this should be extended to corporations who violate competition laws in the market. Though antitrust application to so-called speech concerns may not be direct, proper enforcement of the law against violations where they exist could certainly have positive downstream effects. Antitrust enforcement does not occur in a vacuum. Enforcing against the monolithic dominance of these companies in one sector, if warranted, could free up the market in such a way that concerns over viewpoint bias could be competed away in ways big tech's market dominance now makes impossible. Conservatives who rightly champion the innovation generated by a free market should be equally vigilant about maintaining the integrity of that marketplace. To borrow the old adage from Ronald Reagan, trust, but verify. Conservatism properly understood follows a tradition of skepticism when it comes to concentrations of power. As Barry Goldwater wrote in Conscience of a Conservative, quote, let us henceforth make war on all monopolies, whether corporate or union. The enemy of freedom is unrestrained power, and the champions of freedom will fight against the concentration of power wherever they find it, end quote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bovard. Uh, Professor Lipsky is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Cicilline, and uh, thank you also to uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, as well as uh, Chairman Adler and, and Ranking Member Jordan. Good to see you. Uh, you have my statements. Uh, for the record, and I'm uh, given the length of the witness list, I'm going to try and summarize very briefly. Uh, 130 years ago, a gigantic network industry arose as one of the greatest economic manifestations of the second industrial revolution in the United States, and that was the railroads. And uh, Congress uh, addressed uh, many grievances and problems with the performance of the railroads. Uh, in two fundamentally different ways. In 1887, it passed the first major federal sectoral regulation creating the Interstate Commerce Commission to enforce the Interstate Commerce Act, which was a method of directly regulating competitive outcomes in the railroad industries. And in 1890, it enacted the Sherman Act, which very simply prohibited restraints of competition uh, conspiracies and uh, monopolization. Uh, it's 130 years later, the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Interstate Commerce Act are gone, but antitrust thrives and competition thrives and the success of, of the American economy thrives. In uh, the very early stages of Sherman Act interpretation, the Supreme Court uh, taking a common law approach as Congress intended very quickly determined that cartel activity was to be condemned per se. But then in 1898, in the Addison Pipe and Steel case, it confirmed that, uh, that uh, a restraint could be reasonable if it had a uh, sensible relationship to a transaction with a lawful purpose. And except for the 1911 imposition of the per se rule against retail price fixing, a long period of time uh, happened in which the courts were trying to feel their way through the complex issues that naturally arise uh, when the antitrust laws are, are applied to particular industries. And there's, there are nice judgments that are required to be made uh, to determine what is anti-competitive and what is pro-competitive. 
Then in the late New Deal, in the second uh, Rosa, uh, FDR term, under the leadership of Assistant Attorney General Jackson and, and his successor, Thurman Arnold, something changed in antitrust enforcement. With the encouragement of the antitrust agencies, the courts became far more willing to deprive companies of any right to defend their conduct, either using economic arguments or trying to show on the basis of facts and circumstances that what they were doing was justifiable, pro-competitive, uh, that they lacked market power uh, or, or to present any other defense. This was the start of, of the so-called per se rule era, which uh, occurred around 1945 with the Associated Press decision. Uh, a number of patent licensing practices were condemned per se and on and on until uh, when you reach uh, United States versus Topco, almost any type of conduct challenged by a plaintiff or by the government was condemned per se or, or a very strong presumption against business conduct. The legality of business conduct was adopted by the courts. But simultaneously with the end of that era, uh, America's economic fortunes started to go south. We had uh, severe competition from, com from companies arising in Europe and Asia, and many of our leading industries uh, began to see negative results and our economy uh, entered a period of stagflation. Scholars and academics in law and economics pointed this out in the 60s and 70s, and they weren't all from Chicago. Uh, as a matter of fact, you could say that the study of economics and its application to antitrust law was probably most notably introduced to antitrust enforcement by Lyndon Johnson's first assistant attorney general for antitrust, Don Turner, who had both a Harvard PhD in economics and a Yale law degree, and who advocated very strongly that economic analysis be used as the touchstone uh, for antitrust. And fortunately, in the mid 70s, the Supreme Court began to take that up. And uh, ever since there has been a very powerful consensus uh, in the courts, the bar, the agencies, uh, uh, antitrust practitioners and businesses that have to deal with the very severe antitrust remedies and comply with the law that the focus on competition rather than competitors and the ability to defend oneself based on facts and circumstances and the willingness of the courts to listen, at least listen to economic arguments, those are critical to successful uh, uh, application of the antitrust laws to the economy, uh, not to destroy the economy, but to help it grow. And the Supreme Court and other courts have shown very great flexibility and understanding in absorbing new economic learning and applying it to even the high technology industries as in the Microsoft case, the two Microsoft cases uh, that were litigated in the 1990s and the latter one resolved in 2001. And most recently, for example, in the Ohio versus American Express case. It's not a, uh, it's not a right, left, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, uh, issue successful implementation of the mandate for competition in the antitrust laws encourages innovation, which is the main driver of economic growth, and ensures that our economy uh, continues to uh, grow and prosper. And uh, so, I want to associate myself with Senator uh, with uh, Representative Sensenbrenner's uh, remarks. Uh, I think things are are uh, are very well positioned, and I would I would caution aggressively against any extensive intervention in our common law system of interpreting the mandate of our basic antitrust. Thank law. you, Mr. Lipsky. We're going over time significantly, but uh, the gentleman yields back. I now recognize Sally Hubbard for five minutes. Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today and for conducting this critically important investigation. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google started on their paths to dominance with innovation, but you've uncovered major evidence that the platforms have used anti-competitive conduct and acquisitions to grow and maintain their monopoly power. They violated the antitrust laws as they now stand. You've opened up Americans' eyes to the widespread harms that flow from the illegal monopolization of digital markets. It is one thing that most Americans still can't see what our lives, economy, and country could look like if these markets were open and competitive. 
We've been under monopoly rule for so long that we're suffering from a crisis of imagination. So let's take a moment and envision the possibilities of what America could be. I see an America where anyone can pursue an innovative business idea, get it funded, and build a company that doesn't get crushed by giants protecting their turf. Diverse ideas and founders flourish. Small and big companies can decline platforms' extractive terms of dealing, stop paying them taxes and tolls, reap the rewards of their ingenuity, and pay their employees more. Strong antitrust enforcement creates new waves of innovation, like when the government broke up AT&T and when US v. Microsoft paved the way for Google to exist by stopping Microsoft from taking over every market that touched its monopoly. I see an America where creators of all types, from musicians to journalists, enjoy the fruits of their labor, no longer siphoned off by big tech. I see an America where no company has concentrated control over speech. Public discourse flows freely, not subject to business models that boost divisive and incendiary content. Where when we all see the same speech, we can respond to it with counter speech as the First Amendment requires. This vision of America can be ours if we defeat the robber barons of today, just like we've done before using the antitrust laws. Some say antitrust isn't the right solution and some other fix is the answer. But we are in a crisis. This isn't an either or situation. It's a both and situation. We must attack monopoly rule from every angle. For example, we also need privacy laws, but regulation doesn't work when monopolists are too powerful to comply or when monopolists shape the laws themselves. Others say antitrust is being weaponized for improper purposes, but Senator Sherman always intended to save America from kings of commerce. And if we open up markets by ending platforms anti-competitive tactics and deals, a wide range of benefits will follow. Enforcing the antitrust laws won't magically solve all of our problems, but we won't be able to cure America's ills if we don't first disperse monopolies concentrated power by unlocking competition. Of course, the tech giants each provide useful services, but providing some benefits does not give them a free pass to break the antitrust laws. Unfortunately, our laws have been attacked by the courts for decades, making enforcement expensive and hard. Even so, enforcers need to bring more cases and be more willing to risk losing in court. Ultimately, we are depending on you, Congress, to fix this. Congress should use bright line rules and presumptions to remove complexity and make antitrust cases easier, faster, and cheaper. Congress should overrule legal precedent that imposes obstacles for monopolization and merger cases. Congress should also structurally eliminate the platform's conflicts of interest and remove their incentive and ability to self-preference. It should separate platforms from commerce and divest business lines. The U.S. has used structural separation as a standard regulatory tool and antitrust remedy in networked industries. Congress should require the platforms to offer equal access on equal terms to all, protecting citizens as sellers of goods and services, consumers, and as speakers. Lawmakers should open up competition through interoperability. And immediately, in order to preserve our elections, Congress should ban the surveillance-based hyper-targeting of content. Advertising should be done based on context, not identity. This is a turning point for our nation. Our democracy is hanging in the balance. The time to act is now, decisively, and with courage. Speaking to my fellow Americans, in order for your elected representatives to stand up to monopoly power, they need you behind them. The tech giants have endless lobbying funds, but we the people can once again rise up and prevail against monopolists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Uh, thank you all for your opening statements. And now we'll begin questioning under the five minute rule. And I will begin with the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said in my opening statement, I strongly believe that we must modernize our antitrust laws to meet the challenges of the modern economy. We must update the antitrust laws to reiterate, as Justice Thurgood Marshall said, that antitrust laws are the Magna Carta of free enterprise that are as important to the preservation of economic freedom and our free enterprise system as the Bill of Rights is to the protection of our fundamental personal freedoms. 
What do each of you think is the most important thing we can do from a legislative standpoint to address the deficiencies of, of current antitrust law? Start with Mr. Um, Bayer. Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just briefly, I think uh, we need to modify the standard by which we judge mergers. Uh, the current law says uh, mergers that may tend substantially to reduce competition are problematic. But the way the courts have interpreted that, they've read the word tend to out of the out of law. I think if we move to a materially reduced competition standard, that will help us attack more anti-competitive mergers. Second thing, I think, is to deal with Section 2 of the Sherman Act and basically where a company gets of a certain size and engages in conduct that appears to have a significant effect on limiting opportunities for rivals, that that needs to be a, uh, a potential cause of action where the courts will evaluate whether the pro-competitive benefits or whatever that behavior is are vastly outweighed uh, by the potential harm to consumers and the competition. That's where I would focus on those two areas. There are three primary areas of focus. The first, uh, especially since we are talking about um, big tech, is structural separation. I think that's quite urgent. And again, your um, investigation has shown the incredible abuses of uh, platforms that are also allowed to own um, uh, companies that compete on those platforms. That's major legislation that I think this uh, body should push. Second, a, the series of cases, um, uh, some of which were just mentioned, um, uh, the cases, the predatory pricing uh, uh, trio of cases, I think is really important. This is the uh, Brook Group, Warehouser, and other cases that made it incredibly hard to prove that companies are engaged in predation. Uh, that's important to overturn along with uh, Trinco, uh, Twombly, the series of cases which I and others have outlawed, and I would approach those as a set. Um, which comes to my third point, which is that I would be very clear that the purpose of antitrust law includes the protection of liberty the, and the support of a decentralized economy and move past the consumer welfare standard, which has not been successful over the last 40 years. I said three, but the fourth thing that I think we need to do in this arena is something that both um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hubbard and uh, Mr. Rahman mentioned, which is um, in the communications infrastructure in particular, um, ban targeted advertising. Um, it's, it's truly toxic. It's undermining our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Baer. As you previously testified in 2016, there's been an upswing in extremely large, complex, and blatantly anti-competitive transactions that never should have made it out of the boardroom. Why is it that this trend has continued and possibly even worsened and what can Congress or the agencies do to deter companies from brazenly proposing transactions that are so clearly anti-competitive? As I said earlier, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the standard as interpreted by the courts, the current standard of Clayton Act, our, our merger statute, uh, it, the courts have sort of applied a one-way ratchet that gets tougher and tougher for the government successfully to challenge uh, mergers. It is nearly impossible to challenge today uh, an acquisition by a dominant firm of a nascent competitor, something that isn't a large rival today, but could well be tomorrow. Legislative changes that basically make it clear that once a firm achieves a certain dominance, that uh, the burden shifts to justify that its acquisition of small potential rival, we think Facebook, right? Instagram and WhatsApp. They need to justify why this isn't a problematic merger, why it doesn't eliminate somebody who, either on its own or together with merging uh, with somebody else, might well become an alternative platform to a dominant platform today. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman you back, I now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenmenter, for five Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Lipsky, what shortcomings in the antitrust laws, if any, prevented the Obama-Biden era regulations from examining or blocking 
some of the transactions that have been scrutinized by this investigation. For instance, when Facebook acquired Instagram, it was greenlit by the FTC. I'm not asking you to second guess that decision, but rather to discuss whether the existing antitrust laws were insufficient to allow for a proper review. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Uh, my view is that there are no deficiencies in the antitrust laws. In fact, uh, over the years, uh, our, the legal apparatus built up for the prevention of anti-competitive mergers has become truly formidable. There was some initial question that the Sherman Act as passed uh, applied to uh, corporate uh, transactions. But any doubt about that was eliminated with passage of the Clayton Act in 1914. And then again, the standards were, uh, the, the Clayton Act was broadened and the standards were clarified by the seller keep offer amendments to the Clayton Act in 1950. And then in 1976, you had Hart Scott Rodino, which essentially made it impossible for any significant transaction to be consummated until the uh, federal authorities had been notified of the nature of the transaction, the competitive activities of the parties, and given a very ample opportunity with uh, tremendous discovery powers to investigate and to go to court prior to consummation okay. of the transaction. So you're saying that uh, uh, the existing statutes at the time of the uh, Facebook, Instagram uh, buyout uh, were sufficient to do a proper review? I, I do say that. Okay, now, Mr. Baer, uh, this was before your time as Chief Honcho in the Antitrust Division, but I think you were around at the time. Would you care to respond to that? As I indicated, uh, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, my law school classmate and friend, Tad Lipsky, and I have a bit of a disagreement on this. I do think you look at Instagram or WhatsApp, and you look at some of the documents that were uh, uh, revealed in this committee's, uh, subcommittee's most recent hearing, these were companies that potentially either on their own or in combination with other companies had potential to be rivals. It wasn't clear they were gonna be, but by allowing Facebook to grab these folks up when they're small, Facebook, I think, according to the documents, your investigation has, has uncovered, recognize these firms as potential rivals. Current law does not allow the FTC, or my old place, the antitrust division, uh, to challenge those transactions. You need to be a significant, actual potential competitor in the marketplace in order for antitrust laws to oh, apply. I'm sorry, go ahead. You're, you're, you're essentially saying that the law that was in effect at the time, which I don't think has been significantly changed then, uh, prevented the enforcement during the, the Obama years. That's correct. And I think modest changes to the current statute would allow us to go after those kind of acquisitions by dominant firms. Do you know if DOJ requested an amendment to those laws so that they could be uh, more active in enforcing them? I think while I was there, that debate was just beginning, and as I've watched what's happened to the antitrust laws uh, since then, the way the courts have, as I indicated, this one-way ratchet, imposing more and more conditions on the government to meet its burden of proof, that we are at a place where some tweaks to the antitrust laws would help the courts understand better what the congressional intent was okay. at the time and is today. I'm sorry to filibuster here. Okay, Senator, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, my observation on, you know, on this is that, uh, you know, we hear from DOJ and FTC all the time when they think laws are inadequate and then they come and crack the whip on us to say, let's get it fixed, let's get it fixed right away, not tomorrow, but yesterday. And that there wasn't any real move on the Department of Justice or the FTC uh, to get those laws fixed if uh, this merger uh, did, uh, prevented an enforcement of the laws. You know, the final point I'd like to make is, you know, I think that antitrust law has to be, continue to be focused on consumer welfare uh, rather than deviating into other problem areas. 
if we go back to the basics and enforce those basics, a lot of the complaints that we heard during the previous hearing when the CEOs were here never would have existed. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. I thank the uh, gentleman for um, hosting this hearing. It's been a very important hearing, and uh, it's been a very important topic, and it's time for Congress to act. And I'm happy to uh, be a part of this um, monumental effort. Uh, Mr. Rahman, uh, in July, I asked Apple CEO Tim Cook about Apple's power and control over the App Store. I'm still troubled that in order to sell in the App Store, Apple forces app developers to comply with rules it makes up as it goes along. It develops and sells apps that compete with the app developers who need to be in the App Store in order to gain access to the 100 million Americans who use iPhones. And it also, paces, uh, also forces those app developers to uh, to uh, pay a 30%, it holds them over a barrel and makes them pay 30% of whatever they get out of the app store for selling their products. So it's like the fox uh, owning the hen house and pimping the, the chickens and then eating the chickens. Uh, Mr. Robin, uh, in your written statement, you address the concept of gateway power as a type of infrastructure power that the antitrust laws should address. Uh, can you elucidate a little more on gateway power and how the app store uh, exploits uh, its gateway power? Yeah, thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, it's, it's such an important question because I think all of the platforms that we're uh, talking about in these hearings have this type of gateway power. And I, I love the metaphor you use, the, the fox owning the hen house. The way this works is if you build uh, if you build the kind of infrastructure that everybody needs to, to access basic goods and services, in this case, the App Store, same argument you can make about Facebook or Google, uh, because we all need to get entry into that marketplace, if I'm an app developer, that means that the owner of the App Store, the owner, the person who controls the gates, has a lot of control, a lot of power to, and can demand uh, make unreasonable demands, right, on anyone who needs to get access to that marketplace, to that uh, ecosystem. And so uh, that, they, they may not always use that power uh, in benevolently, they may not always use it in an extractive way, but they have that power nonetheless because they have something that any entrepreneur, business developer needs, which is access to the marketplace. So this is why I think it's so important that any remedy include some basic rules of the road, that if you're going, if if you build that kind of infrastructure and you own the control, the gateway, the access point, it's incumbent upon you as the firm who controls that gateway to observe basic standards of fair treatment, of non-discrimination, and so forth. And that would uh, provide regulators with the tools, if Congress uh, uh, provided them, tools to uh, enforce against those types of practices. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Teachout, um, Amazon has much the same relationship with uh, vendors on its platform. Can you uh, tell us uh, uh, your thoughts about how this works and how consumers are harmed, how, the, how small businesses are harmed, and what Congress should do in order to alleviate uh, this imbalance in our, uh, in our commerce? Um, thank you. There are, I believe, about uh, two million small business owners that depend upon Amazon to get their goods to market. And your investigation, as, along with the research of the um, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, has shown that Amazon charges as much as 30% of every sale. Amazon takes as much as 30% uh, of every sale when those sellers uh, sell uh, on Amazon, on average. This is essentially a form of private tax. And when you talk to Amazon sellers, as you have, you hear about the incredible fear that Amazon sellers have and a kind of rational paranoia about how the algorithms are treating them. 
and their own beliefs that they need to purchase ancillary Amazon services, something that your investigation revealed as a legitimate belief, as uh, Bezos admitted that uh, the use of fulfillment has an impact on the uh, algorithm for the sellers. Um, and, and that's really dangerous for democracy, but it also leads to inequality, because that is essentially Amazon standing like a, at the narrowest por, por, uh, point in the pathway at a choke point moment and demanding a 30% um, of every sale. Thank you. Mrs. Hubbard, um, do you believe Section 2 of the Sherman Act is sufficient uh, to address the conduct that we are uh, discussing? The uh, time Thank of the gentleman Congress. has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Thank you, Congressman. I do not believe Section 2 is sufficient because the self-preferencing and self-prioritization is so rampant that it's basically a game of whack-a-mole. There's just a myriad of ways that these owners of the platforms can privilege their own products and services, and it's nearly impossible to police them all. Um, not to mention because often it's being done through algorithms that are not transparent and are completely opaque. So that's why I advocate for the structural separation um, as a way to remove the incentive and ability of these platforms to prioritize their own products and services. Thank you. Thank I you. Back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Buck, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. I appreciate the bipartisan and thorough nature in which you have conducted this investigation. I want to start by reiterating one of the nation's most important founding principles. As Professor Teachout noted, Congress writes our laws and the courts interpret those laws. In the words of my fellow Coloradan Justice Gorsuch, judges wear robes, not capes. The American people elect their representatives every two years. Our constituents hold us accountable for our votes in a way that judges are not. It's worth remembering this as we examine big tech's anti-competitive action and our nation's antitrust regime more broadly. It's clear that our antitrust enforcement agencies have hobbled themselves by, obser by observing judicial interpretations instead of adhering to the letter of the law, which hampers enforcement agencies' ability to bring cases against industries that do not have a defined price structure or offer free services like big tech. Congress did not intend for regulators to only bring antitrust cases based on price differential. In fact, lawmakers intentionally wrote the Sherman and Clayton Acts with an open-ended consumer welfare framework to enable antitrust enforcement agencies to bring cases also related to quality, output, consumer choice, or potential innovation in the marketplace. Following this original standard would allow regulators to review big tech mergers that offer free services while relying on seller selling user data or make acquisitions based on potential competition. Data presented by McKinsey and Company further shows how dangerous relying solely on price change doctrine can harm the economy. McKinsey's data shows that return on capital in many industries, including restaurants, auto parts stores, department stores, and oil and gas companies has remained nearly steady over the past 50 years. However, two industries show rapid growth, big pharma and big tech. There is a breakdown occurring in the digital economy. A small number of tech titans are using anti-competitive means to grow their marketplace dominance and control the channels of distribution. Our nation's law enforcement agencies can't keep pace. For example, Facebook's acquisition of Instagram was allowed to proceed primarily because there was no defined price change to the consumer. This review didn't take into account Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's stating his desire to purchase Instagram centered on buying an up and coming competitor before they could overtake Facebook's market dominant position. This case shows exactly why the current price focused model of antitrust enforcement misses the mark and fails to account for potential innovation and consumer choice. Congress should lead the way with a meaningful solution to ensure our enforcement agencies are adhering to the original intent of the law, not judicial interpretations. If we don't provide constructive action to address these issues, the progressive left will undoubtedly push for an oppressive regulatory regime. A new Dodd-Frank, along with a CFPB-like agency overseeing the internet will only benefit big tech firms and harm future innovation. This shouldn't be the only action Congress takes, though. This committee should work together to ensure our antitrust regulators have the tools and resources necessary 
to conduct meaningful oversight and successfully bring enforcement cases against bad actors. Currently, the FTC and DOJ Antitrust Division's combined enforcement budget stands at approximately $510 million. Conducting effective oversight and launching antitrust reviews is difficult when your budget is only a minor fraction of big tech's approximately $2 trillion market share and unfailingly deep pockets to combat litigation, comply with regulatory requirements, and pay expert witnesses. Our law enforcement agencies can't keep up with this ons onslaught. Congress should consider allocating more funds to the FTC and DOJ to ensure that they have the proper resources to conduct serious investigations and enforce antitrust laws. We should also work to ensure these agencies can recruit and retain the best possible talent to achieve the mission. We also need to seriously consider increasing scrutiny on big tech companies, including shifting the burden of proof required for a market dominant company to prove that a merger is not anti-competitive. These changes may stop market dominant companies from further consolidating the tech center in an anti-competitive manner. As a conservative, I want to see Congress reassert its Article I duties to write our nation's law. As a former prosecutor, I understand how important it is for our nation's law enforcement agencies to have the tools necessary to fight and win these cases. It's clear that the ball is in Congress's courts. Companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Twitter have acted anti-competitively. We need to rise to the occasion to offer the American people a solution that promotes free and fair competition. Ms. Bovard, could you please offer your thoughts on these proposals? Thank you, Congressman. I think you make a couple of, of really uh, lucid points uh, that are worth emphasizing. We do expect our enforcement agencies to parry with billion dollar companies, the, the biggest the world has ever seen, and we give them minuscule budgets to do it. The ten trillion or the two tr trillion dollars that you mentioned is about 10 percent of U.S. GDP, and that's the tech sector. We need to give our, uh, our enforcement agencies, I think, the resources and commitment from Congress to pursue their full mandate in this space. And I would also add that I think a little bit of humility from our enforcement agencies is necessary, that they may not have always gotten it right. If you look at the last 20 years, there have been about 750 uh, acquisitions that have taken place with relatively little scrutiny. And uh, Bill Kovacic, who is a George W. Bush appointee to the FTC, who voted actually to approve the Google uh, acquisition of DoubleClick in 2008, recently told the New York Times, and I want to make sure I quote him correctly, if I knew in 2007 what I know now, I would have voted to challenge the DoubleClick double -click acquisition. And this tells me that uh, everything that you said is pretty on point. We need to make sure these agencies have the resources to do it, and also that they're not hamstringing themselves by raising the bar on themselves with the laws that currently exist. Section 7 of the Clayton Act, which I think you, you, know, you referenced, is actually a fairly, fairly generous standard when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Uh, you know, the, to quote it, the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. It doesn't specify price competition alone, and it doesn't raise the evidentiary bar on potential completion versus actual competition. So I would like to align myself with your statement, and thank you for the question. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Jaya Paul, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here for what is such an important hearing. I think technology offers us the promise of freedom, and yet, over and over again in these hearings, we've heard about people and businesses that are trapped. Small businesses that can never quite get a fair shake, news sites that lose ad revenue, or other websites that lose viewers because of unregulated practices or conflicts of interest in the many roles of these platforms that disadvantage innovation and, and competition, and would-be innovators and developers have to make products that cater to major tech companies or face the real threat of being copied and crushed. No one likes to feel trapped, but right now I think many people do. And our democracy is trapped too. Ms. Tichel, uh, let me start with you. In other sectors of the economy, like in healthcare markets, Congress has developed legislation that makes certain conduct presumptively illegal, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about this um, through these questions. Do you think a law that would make certain types of mergers presumptively illegal, shifting the burden to the merging parties to prove the transaction would not be harmful to competition could be an effective remedy? Thank you. 
Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, yes, um, you know, in the in the field where I uh, come from, democracy law and anti-corruption law, prophylactic rules are actually absolutely essen essential. You don't investigate every time there's a two thousand seven hundred dollar. If we ha you had to investigate every time there was a ten thousand dollar direct campaign contribution, whether there was something problematic, you would never actually be able to protect against corruption in the campaign finance sphere. So I think it's really important to think about these kinds of prophylactic rules, including the one you talked about, to really shift the burdens. Thank you, Mr. Bear. I saw you nodding. Did you want to add anything to that? Just that I, I, I think. As antitrust lawyers, we tend to think of antitrust law enforcement as often the only solution mm -hmm. to a problem. And there may well be prospective rules. In my testimony, I talked about the FCC rule, basically saying our phone numbers actually were our phone numbers and we could port them elsewhere. That was a prospective rule. It was not a law enforcement action. Basically, there are ways to uh, promote uh, interoperability uh, in, in a fashion that may channel competition in constructive ways. Thank you. Mr. Rahman, I don't believe that many people make the necessary connections that they should between antitrust law and uh, racial equity and economic equity. Um, how would making changes to the antitrust laws help us to empower black and brown communities in particular that have been burdened throughout our history with structural inequities? Thank you, Congresswoman, uh, for that question. It's such an important link to be made. Uh, the antitrust laws we're talking about here really are one of those foundational rules uh, of the road that if we don't change them, we actually leave in place many of the structural inequities along the lines of race that you talked about. So three very quick ways that I would name that are connected around economic opportunity, around labor, and uh, the treatment of workers, and around racist forms of algorithmic bias. So the first piece, this whole point about accessing the marketplace, the new digital infrastructure that we talked about, uh, the burden falls here, monopoly power's burden falls especially hard on small and medium businesses, and in particular on black and brown businesses. If you look at the challenges of business formation, uh, of staying alive and afloat, especially in this kind of an economy, it's the same kind of challenges that we're seeing uh, hitting black and brown businesses in response to, say, the, the COVID economy collapse. Uh, solving this in, in an antitrust policy approach would actually help jumpstart small business formation. No, that's number one. Number two, in terms of workers, uh, we haven't talked about it much yet uh, today, but monopoly power is actually one of the key drivers of the suppression of wages and also the uh, perpetuation of low labor standards, uh, uh, workplace safety standards in, in particular. And when we look at the plight of essential workers, black and brown workers in this moment, whether they're Amazon workers or uh, uh, workers of other dominant firms, Breaking up monopoly power actually is critical to empowering black and brown workers. And finally, the kinds of uh, toxic spread of white nationalism, of extremism online and information platforms like Facebook is fundamentally tied to the ad-based business model that Facebook has. And if we're trying to build a racially inclusive public sphere, we have to tackle the monopoly power that Facebook has. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Ms. Thank Hubbard, um, you argue in your testimony for aggressive antitrust enforcement against platform monopolists. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the structural separation and how it would help small businesses, new tech startups, and consumers uh, if, if we were to implement that? The time of the gentlelady has expired, but the witness may answer the question. I think you may I be think on, you're on mute. mute, maybe, Ms. Hubbard. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as we've heard today, uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, citizens are all beholden to these tech companies and are forced to play by their rules, often paying them, which is the equivalent of taxes. You know, the 30% tax that, that uh, Zephyr Teachout mentioned, the amount that every small business has to pay just to appear in Google search results under their own name, it's a huge tax on small business. So what we have are small businesses paying taxes to these huge companies, and those companies don't, in turn, pay their own fair share of taxes. So um, structurally separating the platforms from the commerce will give everyone a fair shot at innovating, um, at getting the fair rewards of the, sorry, reaping the rewards of their hard work, 
and it will be good for consumers because consumers are human beings and they benefit from the choice, innovation, and quality that robust competitions, competition brings. And they're also citizens that benefit from the free flow of speech and they're workers and employees of companies that benefit when the platform extraction ceases. So we can't think of consumers only uh, in one role because it doesn't make any sense to care about whether I pay low prices, but not care about whether I'm getting paid less. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Ms. Thank Hubert. you, Yield back. back. I recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's uh, just through the course of this investigation that it's obvious that there's bipartisan agreement that there's serious competition concerns in digital marketplaces. We may differ on whether we on whether ex ante antitrust remedies are sufficient for some of these. I like Mr. Bear talking about tweaks versus large scale change. But I mean, at the very least, I'd like to know whether our current anti trust enforcement is capable of addressing at least some of these concerns. And I'm glad you did the double click quote, other than you stole it from me and I'm gonna probably do it again. Um, but I think over the past two decades, there's been, I mean, a lack of antitrust enforcement in digital markets. And I, uh, to illustrate, when we were talking about Google's uh, acquisition to DoubleClick in 2007, it was permitted by the FTC. The acquisition allowed Google to leap forward in third-party digital display advertising where it previously only enjoyed considerable market share in search advertising. And there's an argument to be made that nobody could foresee the future competition concerns at the time that the third-party ad markets were relatively competitive. However, the FTC majority opinion in that case acknowledged that with DoubleClick, Google could engage in a number of potential anti-competitive strategies to further enhance its positions in various markets. The commission dismissed the concern that Google would bundle or tie parts of its growth ad tech stack. And that concern was hypothetical in 2007, but now we know that it was a very real consequence of Google's acquisition. And I said during the last, our last hearing, the major part of this investigation is dealing exactly with those things. And when we talk about like Instagram or WhatsApp or Messenger, it's easy to see those things, but a lot of these acquisitions are of very small companies at the time. And it only gets to be a problem when it's in the aggregate. Um, and I mean, with Google on the ad tech stack, it was both on the buy, buy and sell side, which means they just simply have too much control over ag, uh, um, advertising. And in the case, though, the commission also dismissed an additional concern that consolidation of ad tech stack would create a network effect whereby Google's position would make it more attractive to advertisers, which in turn would make it more attractive to publishers and so on and so on and so on. Ad, Google's ad tech informed by a vast majority of the user data, and they got it from their first party services in Google Maps and Chrome. Um, meanwhile, Google has consolidated its market share by cutting off third parties and cookies. And I, I, I will say this every time I bring up the word cookie, I do not want to be the congressman responsible for bringing them back. But there's no doubt that it consolidated their market share. And I'm not even saying the FTC was right or wrong in that decision, but I'm pointing out the FTC was aware of the concerns, which turned out to be proven correct, did not do any enforcement in the subsequent years. And even though the majority FTC opinion concluded by promising to watch the online advertising market closely in the future. And that was, I think, towards William Kovacek's quote. If he'd known then what he knew in 2007, he would not have voted to challenge, or he would have voted to challenge that. And since 2007, Google spent billions of dollars to acquire a lot of other key ad tech firms, some big, some small. This is one anecdote, however, there's similar stories and concerns throughout the digital marketplace. The DOJ right now, though, is a, and FTC are con conducting investigations and suit, and I mean, suits are reportedly imminent. That seems to me to be at least the most aggressive antitrust enforcement we've seen in, in decades. And I, I concur with my friend Ken Buck from Colorado. This is one area where I, I mean, I do think we need more money, more resources, more enforcement. Um, Mr. Barry, your testimony discusses additional resources for after action studies, which obviously this would be easier on the front end, but sometimes that's not always realistic. Um, where agencies did not, and in studies of what have happened in markets where agencies did not bring enforcement actions. Can you elaborate how an after action review of an instance like double click merger would result in better antitrust enforcement? Absolutely, sir. Um, and um, the best example is hospital consolidation. 
we saw the courts hostile to uh, the creation of monopolies or near monopolies in local markets um, uh, as hospitals uh, chains combined over the course of the 80s and 90s. Uh, uh, Tim Muris, Republican chairman of the FTC, commissioned after action studies of what those markets look like after consolidation occurred and the courts had rejected the FTC's merger challenge. They found dramatic price increases in those markets. It established the FTC was right. In subsequent hospital merger challenges, the FTC was able to go to court, use those economic studies, and, and demonstrate, hey, this risk is real, and the courts responded. Thank you, and at the risk, because uh, I'm, uh, you know, and it, like it wasn't just double click though, it was AdMob in 09, AdMeld in 2011, AdMetry in 2014, and so when you were talking about tweaking on mergers and changing the standard, I'm interested in having that conversation possibly offline because I'm not sure any one of these meet it initially. But when you look back, we, I mean, I think in some instances, we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with that. And I know that's not ideal. You see it right now with Instagram and Messenger trying to combine their data. Well, that's gonna be, I mean, just practically, it makes it harder to intertwine. But do you think after action reports considering how these companies work are a key part to enforcement It's, a, it's a key tool, but in addition, statutory changes which would require a dominant firm to offer an affirmative justification for its acquisition of smaller nascent competitors would actually empower the antitrust agencies to address that potential accumulation over time of, of significant enhanced market power. My only concern with that is that a lot of these companies build themselves solely for the purpose of getting bought out. I mean, eventually we get into a capitalize. We saw that with the Sprint T-Mobile merger. It was never a question between four and three. It was going to be a question between four and two. But I won't use too much. Thank you, sir. Well, I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the distinguished gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Demings, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, so much to our witnesses for being with us uh, today. Um, Mr. Baer, you know, it, it's always so important. You know, we, we would have never thought, of course, 20 years ago uh, when we really 30, 40 years ago when we really began um, that we would have um, companies that have grown or mergers that would grow so huge until they really affected everybody else in an adverse way around, around them. Um, you talked about um, that sometimes the fear of getting it wrong really kind of stifles our ability to do what we need to do in this space. Could you please expound on that a, a little bit and also talk a, little, a bit about the path forward, the fear of getting it wrong? Well, thank you, and thank you for reminding me I've been at this business over 40 years. But um, <laughs> the, um, uh, the fear of getting it wrong is sort of an outgrowth of an overreach by the Chicago School of Economics. It's basically the notion that unless we're 100% certain that there's an antitrust problem, we should stay back. And that has been infused into the thinking of the courts. I don't blame the courts for that thinking, it is just this one-way ratchet which has gotten tougher and tougher for the government or a plaintiff to prove up an antitrust case. And that's why I conclude that one of the key solutions has to be Congress stepping forward and instructing the courts that no, we meant if there's a tendency to substantially reduce competition, you should act. The courts need to intervene. So it's that that hesitation about getting it wrong, avoidance of what they call type, type one errors, errors of over-enforcement, that I think has shifted the pendulum way to the wrong side. You also talked about uh, additional resources or the need for additional resources. Uh, why should Congress give additional resources when many of the companies that we're talking about have not appropriately used the resources that they have effectively for uh, enforcement efforts? Look, you can, one can always criticize the Federal Trade Commission, where I once worked, the Antitrust Division, where I once worked, for not doing it exactly right. But mm -hmm. I think they have used the resources Congress has appropriated them, in most cases, quite appropriately. The problem is, those resources are so small 
in, uh, in comparison to the size of the economy, to the number of acquisitions going on, to the behaviors this subcommittee is properly investigating and properly concerned about. So you look at as, uh, the ratio, uh, the ratio suggests we need to strike the balance a little differently. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cades, uh, you talked about the need for reform and not just uh, enforcement and thinking about legislation to revitalize our country's antitrust law. What do you think are the most important principles right now that Congress should consider? I should remember that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Congresswoman. I think you want to think about this in the big picture as you have a court that continually doesn't want to enforce the law. I think the way the, the bipartisan in this committee thinks it should be enforced. So the first thing you have to do is you need laws that will strip back decisions that limit, um, limit antitrust enforcement. Professor Teachout talked about Trinco. There is a whole list. The second thing you want to do is something along the lines of what Bill Baer suggested is you want to tweak the statute because at least that sends a signal you're doing it wrong. And then the third thing I think you want to do where you can, this, is not, this may sound small, but it's very powerful, is you create presumptions where you are more concerned about the harm from the conduct than, under, than the potential costs of over-enforcement. Um, and so in that sense, it's, you know, the way you deal with what Congressman Armstrong's deal with, is you want the FTC to be more aggressive when they see something like a double-click that looks new you give them the tool that they don't have to go in and disprove every potential benefit. The company has to come forward and say, yeah, we, we understand there's a problem. We have to show you it's a good thing. So I think it's those three things. Could you also finally talk a little bit about how you believe interoperability could help? Right. So I think that the interesting thing about interoperability is not as a solution itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's one of these things... I know, Professor, you talked about how, how hard it is, but you know, it's amazing the way companies can find interoperability when it suits their purposes. So right, I can call you on the sex telephone, I can text you, we don't have to be on the same, we don't have to be on the same system. But if, you were on, if you're not on Facebook, somehow it's, in, you know, I can't put up a post on Facebook that goes to you if I want to friend you. Like that's apparently technologically impossible. But if I could, it means if you don't like Facebook, if you, or as, as, as Congressman Jordan talks about not liking the, the way they engage in, in censorship, you can walk away from Facebook and you don't lose contact with all your friends, right? And so that allows competition to occur and that has the benefit of reducing the incentives and the ability to exclude competition. Great. Thank you so much. I yield back. The general lady yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My questions are for Ms. Bavard. Uh, in May of this year, President Trump issued an executive order to prevent online censorship. The executive order discusses Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Ms. Bavard, have big tech companies abused Section 230 to their advantage? Well, thank you for the question, Congressman, and the short answer, I believe, is yes. Um, when conservatives think about Section 230, I think it's important to point out that the statute, uh, kind of reflecting the conversation we're having here, has become so judicially distorted from what Congress initially passed that what we rely on for its application today is, is very bloated and, and a bulletproof immunity exists where a porous, narrow one was originally passed. So it is my view uh, that yes, the companies have abused this practice to the extent that it is now referred to as an implicit financial subsidy to these companies. Well, so you kind of touched on it there. Can you, can you explain other ways that Section 230 has been misused and wrongly applied? Well, I think as I outlined in my written statement, Section 230 uh, has originally passed as the Good Samaritan standard, has, a, has actually allowed a lot of bad Samaritans a lot of cover. Um, there's been uh, well-documented evidence of the fact that you know, sex trafficking, uh, all kinds of human trafficking, terrorism, uh, revenge pornography, all flourishes on these platforms, and the companies are immune from any liability for it. Um, in 2018, Congress passed FOSTA-SESTA uh, to, to make them liable for knowingly participating in the facilitation of sex trafficking, but there's a whole lot of other criminal and, and lewd and harassing content that occurs, and these companies, as opposed to being the good Samaritan that could you know, walk by and help the guy out of the ditch, they can walk right by and there's no consequence. 
How does the president's executive order seek to promote free speech and rectify this online censorship issue that's been discussed? So the president's executive order does two things that I think are very important. The first is that it, you know, petitions, uh, has NTIA petitioned the FCC to bring Section 230's application back to its original intent, which, as we discussed, is a very narrow immunity focused on um, the original title of the amendment itself, which is the Family Online Empowerment Act, um, allowing basically you to clean up the internet. And the second thing it does that I think is really important is it enforces a measure of transparency onto these companies. Um, a lot of the censorship and, and bias they get away with uh, happens because they don't have to tell us what they're doing. They've never popped the hood and let us look in. And they could. They could put allegations of bias to, to bed if they let us uh, look under the hood of what they're doing, but they don't. So I think that transparency is also very important. Do you believe that Section 230 reform is an avenue for addressing some of these online censorship issues? I do because it enforces accountability and transparency on companies who right now have none of it. Uh, and I think companies that can uh, upset half of their user base without consequence because they know they have nowhere else to go deserve a little bit of accountability uh, and transparency requirements for uh, a substantial benefit, a government mandated privilege that they receive. What specific reforms uh, should Congress consider when examining ways to address uh, the pitfalls with Section 230? So I think uh, the proposal uh, that Ranking Member Jordan mentioned in his uh, opening statement I think sounds like a very good place to start. It deals with the otherwise objectionable part of Section 230, which again has become this sort of massive catch-all for the companies to enforce against viewpoints they don't like without any consequence. I think addressing that particular uh, part of the law I think will be very useful. And again, I think the transparency, when you have to show what you're doing, when you have to show your work, it's a lot harder uh, just to say, trust me, uh, to no consequence. You actually have to show conservatives that you're uh, listening to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here today. I'd yield uh, any of my remaining time to Ranking Member Jordan. I'll yield back. I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagus. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I want to come to Ms. Teachout. Uh, welcome, Professor Teachout. Um, in your testimony, you advocate what you call structural separation, uh, a Glass-Steagall approach to antitrust in this field. Um, but why has Congress approached concentrated markets like financial services or telecom this way in the past? And what is its resonance with American constitutional principles of structural separation of powers. Thank you for your question. Uh, what we've seen in the past, you mentioned Glass-Steagall, which I also me mentioned in my written testimony. Uh, you also see laws like the uh, Public Utility Holding Act, um, which uh, prohibits companies who are subject to the act, who play the sort of central uh, public utility role from uh, engaging in acquisitions unless there's an SEC approval. And, and the key uh, theory here is that you don't want conflicts of interest at the heart of your economy with essential infrastructures. You don't want uh, your... Uh, um, uh, pipelines to have a conflict with what is going through those pipelines. And decentralizing that power instead of having platforms that uh, enable competition on those platforms instead of using those to kill, acquire, or copy, as you've shown in your investigation, um, is, is really important for uh, both for allowing the thriving of small businesses, but all for, also from stopping these platforms from be becoming a form of private government. And this is something that Justice Douglas um, uh, spoke about, the uh, inevitable tendency of all private power to form a government in and of itself. Structural separation is one of the key tools to prohibit these private powers from becoming private governments that coexist with our democratic government. Well, would that undermine innovation? Would it undermine competition? Would it harm consumers? Well, I, in general, I would say that uh, the more feudal a system is, the less innovation you're going to see. 
And what we're talking about, you know, when you talk about the democratic threat, it's essentially a feudal threat that you see Amazon playing a feudal role, uh, Facebook playing a really dangerous feudal role deciding which newspapers uh, uh, get prioritization in your news feed, uh, YouTube playing this role. And the more you see a feudal system, actually the more you see a closed and fearful system and a less innovative system. Um, so, yes. But tell us about what you think the role of Congress is today and historically in the development of antitrust principles. Um, if Congress doesn't do it, what happens if we're not updating and modernizing the antitrust laws? Yeah, I mean, Congress for, uh, from the uh, 1890s, 1880s onward has played, played this really central role, recognizing that protecting fairness and a thriving economy is the quintessential congressional role and also protecting our democracy and protecting the corruption of the takeover of these forms of private government is a quint quintessential congressional role. And then starting in the 80s, you saw Congress really step back from this role. You saw this deep depoliticization. Uh, instead, when, when these uh, cases came down, cases we've been talking about today, whether the cases involving um, uh, predatory pricing or changes to merger law, you didn't see congressional hearing. There was a kind of tacit acceptance that the Supreme Court was the right institution to be making decisions about the shape of our economy. There couldn't be, this is a terrible institution to be making decisions about the shape of our economy. That said, I do want to address some of the, um, something that has uh, not been addressed enough, I think. I think we, Congress's other role is to light a fire under enforcement agencies. I would not allow enforcement agencies to get away with saying that, the, the, you know, although the laws, uh, the court has made these laws harder to enforce, um, uh, the FTC can engage in much more aggressive rule making, much more aggressive enforcement. In fact, I would say that your investigation has shown some really deep failures in the aggressiveness of the FTC. So I think there is a double role. One is ongoing investigations and ongoing responsibility taking for the structures of power and the structures of the economy here in Congress. And second is ongoing oversight and lighting a fire under the um, agencies in an ongoing way. Well, are there benefits to a regime where you have multiple um, levers of enforcement in the federal bureaucratic context, uh, state attorneys general, private plaintiffs? Do you want to try to multiply the different sources of enforcement? Yeah, time of the gentleman has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Um, it's absolutely essential to multiply levers of enforcement. In fact, in the uh, first Congress of this country, about half the laws had key TAM provisions because there was concern about capture or corruption of, of uh, in, impossible enforce, enforcement agencies. So you need to have a dynamic interaction uh, with broad private rights of action, um, uh, uh, state attorneys general, um, agencies, and Congress all constantly engaging instead of passively accepting the Supreme Court and big companies taking over this area. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bovard, is cancel culture real? It certainly is, sir. 62, a recent survey, 62% of the American people said they're afraid to freely express their thoughts and opinions. I think most Americans agree that it's, it's darn real, it's scary. I think Professor Teachout just, I think the quote she just said, uh, closed and fearful system that we find ourselves in. If 62% of the American people are afraid to express themselves, do you have a functioning First Amendment? Uh, you don't. It would seem that would violate the very intent of the First Amendment, which is to provide a robust protection for speech of all kinds. Yeah, silence is not the First Amendment, and that's exactly what the cancel culture mob is wanting. They're wanting us to be silent. In fact, I think it's even worse. They want us to agree with them. Do you have free speech if only one side is allowed to talk? You, you do not. You have one source of information only that is not free speech or free thought, I would add. Yeah, so if you don't have free thought, you don't have free speech, you have a closed and fearful system, you have a system where 62% of the American people are afraid and reluctant to express their thoughts, their opinions, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous place to be. Is big tech a part of this phenomena we now find ourselves in? I would say absolutely. I think that the bias that we've discussed is a symptom, actually, of its market power. Uh, Google filters information for 92% of the world, 87% of America. So whatever they choose to amplify or suppress is what 
billions of Americans, or, or sorry, billions of people around the world see, that's a problem. It strikes me as it's too, it strikes me as twofold. One, they can censor themselves. We know about that. We know what Google tried to do to the Federals. We know what Twitter will do to the President of the United States, but yet then turn around and let the Ayatollah of Iran spew the things that he wants to spew. So they can engage in it themselves, but then they also provide a platform for other people to attack and, and try to cancel opinions they disagree with. Now, I don't know how we deal with that. We just got to fight back and, and, and be able to use the platform and, and, and fight back with that. But that second part, Barry Weiss actually called. Barry Weiss, the, the individual who had to resign or who did resign, or she had to, she resigned from the New York Times. She called that second phenomenon the digital thunderdome, a term that I just thought struck me as exactly what happens when the mob starts attacking positions they don't like. So it seems to me we come to the, the critical question, what's the answer? How do we address it? Well, I think I would actually go back to something that Ms. Hubbard actually referenced in her opening statement, which is that the answer, the antidote to bad speech and suppression of speech is more speech. And I think- Always uh, has been in this yeah. country, always has been. So whatever incentives that Congress can give uh, through the tools that, you know, they already are involved with these tech companies with Section 230 with sort of this antitrust immunity that, that they've given these tech companies, whatever incentives that Congress can give these companies to abide by what we, uh, in Section 230, designed for, right, which is robust political debate, a diversity of views, I think it's incumbent upon Congress to do that. Um, seems to me that, it seems I agree with that, and, and it, uh, I want you to take a good look at the legislation I briefly referenced in my opening comments, legislation that we've introduced today. Um, it seems to me that would be something we could all agree on, because there's definitely some disagreement. We heard what Ranking Member Sensenbrenner said. We heard out. We've heard what folks on the Democrat side said about is existing antitrust law good enough? Or uh, the truth is, I don't know. It may be, it may not be. Do we have to change it? Well, we'll look at that. Is it more robust action, as some of the Democrat witnesses have said, from the agencies? Uh, probably all, all of that's important. But it seems to me we should be able to agree on Section 230 and what needs to be changed there to foster more speech and not allow these big tump, uh, tech companies to censor, particularly, I think, censor, censor conservatives. Would you agree with that? I would. I think the, there's a lot of proposals to reform Section 230, which I think reflects the sentiment that you just suggested, which is that they all have one goal, which is to force more accountability on these platforms for speech, uh, for the criminal acts that flourish there. And I think it's a, it's a very important uh, area to address. To your point, I do think this is a multi-pronged problem that is going to probably require multi-pronged approaches right. across different sectors of policymaking. Section 230 is one of them. And, and you know what else I think is important? I think you have to call it out every single time you see it. Every time big tech censors somebody, it should be called out, particularly now. I mean, particularly now, four and a half weeks before a major election. I mean, maybe the biggest election. And, and we know what happened in 2016. We know what Google tried to do to help the Clinton campaign. So you have to call it out every single time. And then hopefully we can get some bipartisan support for the Section 230 changes that I think everyone, if we all just sit down and work, we all agree need to happen. I'll give you the last word for the last 15 seconds. I would agree with that because I would like to get to a point where these big tech giants don't have nearly the power they have uh, over speech, over election, over independent behavior. I do not think we can function as a free society when we are ruled by tyrannical corporations. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to start by commending the members and the staff of this committee for the incredible work they've done over the course of, of this uh, hearing series. Um, it's an historic investigation. The report coming forward is shedding light on the crushing power of big tech and has really brought before the American people a desperately needed conversation on what do we need to do to reform our antitrust laws. So I'm proud to have been a part of this process. Very grateful to the chairman for having initiated it and, and walked us all through this. Um, you know, over the course of the last year, we've laid out how Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and others um, have used monopolistic tactics to exert undue market power. In doing this, these companies stifle innovation, kill competition, and harm the American public. We certainly hear about it every day from our constituents. Um, I have little reason to believe that without regulatory intervention, these companies will continue to act in their self-interest rather than the in, in the interest of free and fair competition or privacy. Um, over the course of the investigation, it became clear a 
conversation on rethinking traditional antitrust law is needed. Companies competing in the digital marketplace on the scale we see today could not have been conceived of when the Sherman Antitrust Act and our other anti-monopoly laws were, were created. And decades of court rulings have obviously made it harder and harder to use traditional antitrust laws to bring enforcement measures against these companies. So in addition to looking at how we can use traditional antitrust law to bring companies to heel, we also have to identify the areas where we can make reforms to beg better regulate and police the digital marketplaces. So looking forward to how we develop a modern antitrust code that can respond to the major competition issues of this time. And I'm hopeful that our report and the expert testimony of our witnesses today will serve as a launching point for enforcement and reform legislation. Now, using the predatory pricing models to drive out competition is a classic monopolistic uh, tactic. And in our hearing in July, I raised concerns with Amazon's scheme to artificially lower the prices of diapers in order to drive down a competitor's profits until they could acquire that competitor. And this had a real impact on parents who saw, after the acquisition, saw the cost of Amazon diaper products rise as a result. So Ms. Teachout, do you see this predatory pricing scheme as a symptom of a company that's grown so large they no longer care about what's best for consumers? As a uh, mother of an almost two-year-old, I feel that the diapers problem on a regular basis. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for raising it. Um, look, uh, it's a, it's a, 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 the diapers acquisition, and thank you for your line of questioning, which was very powerful. It was an example of the moment, uh, one of the moments where great research and great preparation really revealed something powerful, is it showed that, um, I, I believe you, uh, uncovered just how much Amazon was willing to lose to, <laughs> in order to, to govern that market. And I think one of the things it showed is the really deeply problematic nature of court-driven um, antitrust policy. Because what we saw in um, Brook Group and Weyerhaeuser and these series of uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, antitrust cases is a statement that predatory pricing of exactly this kind was really unlikely to happen. It was uh, a statement based in economic theory but not in the economic realities. And it's just an example of how incredibly important it is for this body to act to make clear that that kind of predatory pricing cannot happen going forward. Right now, we do not know the full scope and range of, I'll be quick, of um, predatory behaviors going on, but we have reason to suspect it's far broader than anything we know. And the opacity of these companies uh, makes it very easy to cross-subsidize in ways that really crush competition. And do you have suggestions about how we can use reform to combat this? Uh, well, sure, overturn uh, the, the trio of cases that changed the predatory pricing laws. I mean, this is something Congress does in other areas. Uh, when uh, uh, President Obama became president, his first bill, the Lilly Ledbetter Act, was overturning bad uh, Supreme Court interpretation of congressional statutes. So here again, it is your responsibility to take this moment and overturn bad uh, Supreme Court interpretation of congressional statutes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I do have to say I'm struck by the fact that when they passed the Sherman Antitrust Law, they probably were not thinking about diaper pricing and did not have witnesses like yourself or representatives like myself. Thank you to all of our witnesses. We really appreciate your insights today. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagoose, for five minutes. Thank and the you, vice chair. Mr. Chairman. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank each of the witnesses uh, for their testimony today and very thoughtful presentations with respect to the legislative recommendations that uh, this committee is poised to potentially make to the full Congress. I uh, would be remiss if I didn't say, first and foremost, just how much I've appreciated serving as the vice chair of this committee, particularly. Uh, given the investigation that we have undertaken. And uh, I want to give my uh, gratitude to the chairman, to Chairman Cicilline, for his thoughtful leadership. I think the way that he has approached this investigation uh, in leading, uh, of course, our uh, council and the staff to the committee and on a bipartisan basis working uh, to try to get to the bottom of these very serious vexing issues that impact every consumer in our country, uh, in my view, has just been a tremendous example of how Congress can work 
uh, well when we are working at our best. And so I want to say thank you again, Chairman Cicilline, and with the ranking member of the subcommittee as well. Uh, we appreciate his leadership and, of course, uh, wish him well in his, uh, in his retirement. I, I want to, I, I guess, perhaps end the hearing in a similar way in which we started it. The ranking member asked a series of questions around Facebook in particular, and uh, I think that Facebook provides uh, perhaps one of the best examples for this committee and for the country really to consider in terms of acquisitions of competitive and, and nascent threats, you know, undeniably helping uh, a company amass and, and maintain market dominance. And I think that was exposed during the course of the hearing, of course, that we held in July with the CEO and uh, the documentary evidence that this committee was able to compile uh, during the course of our investigation. Ms. Hubbard, in your prepared testimony, uh, I believe you argue, and I think I'm quoting this accurately, that enforcers should unwind illegal mergers that they didn't catch. And you cite Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram as examples of uh, what you believe uh, could be illegal mergers. I wonder if you could expound a bit on why, in your view, antitrust enforcers didn't catch these anti-competitive acquisitions in real time, because I think it's fairly clear from the documentary evidence that we've compiled that it was, in fact, an anti-competitive acquisition. And it was consistent with Facebook's, uh, you know, kind of modus operandi, if you, you will, which uh, Professor Teachout articulates really well in terms of, you know, copying competitors, acquiring competitors, or eliminating them. Thank you for the question. Um, I think in this hearing, we've let the enforcers off the hook a little too lightly um, to hear the conversations we've had about the Google DoubleClick emer merger, for example, and we've said, how could we have foreseen that? All you need to do is read the dissenting statement of Pamela Jones Harbor. She foresaw everything. So who is in the majority matters, okay? If we had three Chopras or Slaughters running the FTC right now, we'd be having vastly different enforcement. So people matter. If Pamela Jones Harbor had been in, in charge, th that deal may have not gone through. She was urging for greater scrutiny. So, you know, why did they miss these mergers? I think they were um, trained in the Chicago school ideology, which has been a failure at enforcing the antitrust laws in a way that protects anybody it's the consumer welfare standard, but it hasn't protected consumers at all. And that ideology is incredibly narrow. And they look at, oh, Facebook is this kind of a product and Instagram is a photo sharing app. And they don't do any kind of a real thoughtful analysis that, hey, is this a competitor that they're acquiring? I didn't see any, any of the you know, discussion of, wow, this is a really hard case to win. And so you know, even though we think it's a problem, we're not going to do it. What I saw is they didn't do a thorough enough investigation. They didn't get the documents. The documents that your investigation has shown, if, if any antitrust enforcer was presented with those documents, you need to try to bring that case. Even if you think you might lose, you need to bring that case. So it is a failure. But the good thing is that it's not too late because there's no rule that you can't unwind an illegal acquisition later in the future. So that should still happen. It's very critically important for our democracy, for elections, for all kinds of the problems that we're seeing because that result from Facebook not having any competitive threat because it acquired its top competitors. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And obviously, there's been public reporting, as you know, uh, the FTC is certainly investigating uh, whether uh, Facebook illegally maintained its dominance in the social media market uh, through those acquisitions of, you know, 80 some odd companies in the course of 15 years. Uh, uh, so in any event, I, I certainly share your sentiments. And as somebody who uh, previously served in a gubernatorial administration in Colorado prior to coming to Congress, running the state's regulatory department back there, I certainly can attest that personnel is policy in every sense of that phrase. And so if your, your point is a salient one. And I, I guess I'm running out of time here, but the, the last question I would have for you, Ms. Hubbard, and to the extent uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Teachout uh, will wish you to opine on this as well. I've certainly read her uh, report with uh, uh, Mr. Stoller in depth and I and, uh, think their recommendations are very thoughtful of just what statutory changes in addition to potentially overturning, of course, uh, the uh, precedents that were referenced by Professor Teachout uh, to federal antitrust law should Congress pursue to ease uh, challenging dominant firms uh, from, uh, or rather, ease uh, the uh, dominant firms' acquisitions of nascent competitors. 
The uh, time of the gentleman has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so I think for when it comes to acquisitions of nascent competitors, we definitely need to uh, reform the standards that are completely broken. But the easiest way would be to go through a bright line rules process for mergers. Uh, we could look at the 1968 merger guidelines as a model for how to do that, where it just says if you have a certain amount of market power, you are not allowed to acquire any further companies. And if you want to grow your market power, you need to do it by investing in products and your workers and you need to grow organically. You're not allowed to do any kind of a merger once you have a certain size. And these clear thresholds would get rid of the burdens on enforcers that make it too hard and too expensive to win mergers. It would also create very clear rules for the marketplace so that everyone knows what's acceptable and um, would help, you know, it, we need to go further than just little tweaks here and there. We need actually bright line rules. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for continuing to bring these important um, measures before the body today. And thank you so much for each of you. Um, we're really glad to be hearing from you today as we continue to examine the antitrust and also the anti-competitive uh, nature of big tech. When I had the opportunity to ask questions of the CEOs of big tech companies, I focused on the harms that were faced by small businesses. I asked Mr. Bezos about Amazon's treatment of third-party sellers, small businesses who want to sell on Amazon. I asked Mr. Cook about developers who want to make their apps available in the App Store and the users who were disappointed when their favorite apps just suddenly disappeared. In both cases, Amazon and Apple exercised immense control over whose products, whether physical or digital, are available in their marketplaces. And this leaves small businesses beholden to their whims as they try to maintain a business, create jobs, and provide for their own families. After our last hearing, even more Amazon sellers reached out to this committee and to my office with the same similar concerns. Sellers have told us over and over again that they feel that they are dispensable. So, um, Ms. Teachout, you made recommendations um, in your testimony um, about reforms that we could take, reforms that we could make. Um, do you have anything to add on those reforms that can help third-party sellers or app developers. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, very powerful questioning. Um, as you saw in response to your questions, the, uh, the CEOs will always have some reason for kicking off their competitors uh, because it's better for consumers, but it looks from the outside like they are using their platform power to really squeeze and really hurt small businesses. And I, I just wanna add one thing. I, we are in the middle of a global pandemic where small businesses are facing uh, uh, a, a true catastrophe. And it is more important than ever that we support those small businesses in this moment during a time when uh, margins are tight if they're there at all. So the most important thing to protect small businesses is a structural separation. Is the most important thing for those Amazon sellers is that they are able to go to Amazon as a place where they sell their wares, but not feel like they are then obliged to go to the feudal lord of Amazon and say, to get prioritization, I will use your advertising. To get prioritization, I will use your fulfillment services. And those sellers are not um, uh, legitimately fearful that their, their brilliant creative ideas will be ripped off and then used by Amazon to compete against them. So structural separation to me is the simplest and most powerful tool for supporting small businesses at this moment. Thank you so much for that answer. And Mr. Cadis, do the reforms uh, that you're supporting actually, do they have a risk of unintended consequences? Could you, and if they do, why, why or why not? Okay, so I think I actually forgot to turn it off last time, but I'm 0 for 3 today. Um, th th thank you for that, for that question. But 
I think it's foolish for anyone to say, I have an idea for reform and it's totally costless and there never will be unintended consequences. So that's true. Um, but what I think is also true is when we look at the situation of where the law is, the cost of doing nothing is tremendous. I mean, this committee, in some sense, when we address the question of whether the antitrust laws are in the right position, this committee in a bipartisan way already answered yes. Earlier this, in this Congress, twice you passed bills directly trying to address the failure of the courts to, go, to condemn clearly anti-competitive activity in the healthcare field, both the Pay for Delay and the CREATES Act. Right? That's, those were much simpler issues than the types of issues that are flowing around with tech. Those were cases involving price, and the, still the courts are getting them wrong. So I think if we do nothing, what we mean, what we're saying is the government is no longer concerned about regulating dominant companies and it's just free reign. Um, can the reforms have a negative consequences? As I said yes, but I think that's always the, that's the decision Congress always makes. Thank you very much. And one last question for Ms. Hubbard. Of the reforms that you were recommending, uh, which ones do you think will do the most to address the harms uh, that have been faced by these small businesses. Uh, as you know, um, one who's been working in gun safety, I know that there's not one solution to the expansive culture of gun violence, but what do you believe a, a reform that will do the most effective, efficient, expedient um, change? Yeah, I'll have to agree with uh, Professor Teachout, early, her comment earlier about structural separation. It's just the most administrable. It is, um, you know, a preventative solution that just eliminates the conflicts of interest and creates uh, a playing field that's level. It just doesn't work to have dominant corporations, you know, playing the game and controlling it too, right? They have to do one or the other. And um, you just can't police every little incident because there are so many opportunities for them to favor their own products and services and so many opportunities for them to put the thumb on the scale that we just can't even see. Uh, it's just not possible to get at all of those through individual enforcement actions. And that's why I think the structural separation, which has been done in American history uh, many times in many industries is the best solution. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for yielding back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Professor Teach, I, I would like you to respond to an argument that we have heard during the course of this investigation that, that Congress suddenly becoming active in this antitrust space risks rendering antitrust laws dangerously political and that somehow our efforts to sort of get the policy around the antitrust modernized and updated creates uh, some perception that we're politicizing antitrust. I wonder if you'd respond to that argument. Economic policy and anti-corruption policy are arguably the core jobs of Congress, protecting the people of this country uh, from tyrants and allowing for a thriving economy. There is recent research that um, Mr. Rahman uh, alluded to showing that corporate concentration is leading to a transfer of as much as $14,000 per year from workers to investors. This is a major driver of inequality. Nobody doubts that labor law is your job, that tax law is your job, that campaign finance law is your job. And when it comes to antitrust, antitrust and anti-monopoly law is about the country sharing its vision of what a moral, fair, and thriving economy uh, looks like. There is nothing more congressional than antitrust law. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. You said it much more articulately than I could have. Miss <laughs> um, Hubbard, uh, I'd like to now ask you, um, there obviously is a significant reporting that and, and we're all aware that the state attorneys general, the FTC, and the DOJ are all pursuing antitrust investigations into the major dominant technology platforms, and some reporting that lawsuits may be filed very soon. Um, some have also suggested that, you know, Congress should just wait to see how these cases turn out before pursuing legislative reform. I, of course, have suggested to them that 
there are two very different proceedings. One is an enforcement proceeding, which we are not a, a we are not prosecuting uh, an enforcement action. But ours is, as Professor Tijar just mentioned, it, ours is public policy development, and the urgency of doing our work uh, cannot be overstated. And so, of course, we shouldn't await those. I just want to be sure that I'm not off course with that thinking. Right, and as you know, I was at the New York AG's office, and they're part of these uh, investigations. So I, I, uh, I still don't think you should wait for them. Um, and the reason is there is so much conduct, so much anti-competitive conduct to go after, that the agencies are just trying to bite off little tiny pieces that they can work on that are just a tiny fraction of the anti-competitive conduct that's going on. So. They're not, you know, getting the whole landscape of all the different ways that these companies are abusing their monopoly power to exclude competition. The other thing is that antitrust cases take years. So we have very pressing issues here about small business, about citizens, about democracy, about speech. We need urgent action right now in the middle of this global pandemic. We can't wait five, ten years for our antitrust case to, to finish up. Thank you. And the last thing is we've seen some strong antitrust cases lately that the judges just completely screw up. I mean, the, the New York State AG sued to block the Sprint T-Mobile merger. That was a classic antitrust case of three to two major competitors. It should have been blocked. The evidence was overwhelming that it would lead to a price increase under the Chicago School theory of consumer uh, welfare, and they still didn't win. So we just can't put this in the in the hands of the courts. It's too important and too urgent. I do urge those enforcers to carry on and do their job, but we need you as well. Thank you. Uh, and Professor Rahman, uh, in your written statement, you note that tech platforms like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple represent essential infrastructure, just like the railroads, bridges, and telegraph lines of a century ago. And you write about the dangers of unchecked private control over social, economic, and political infrastructure. And I wonder if you could just speak a little more about what that kind of infrastructure and the power that accompanies it means and why uh, our responsibility in terms of developing good public policy in this context is so important. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I think like a lot of the other speakers today have alluded, you know, this. Uh, we're in such a crisis moment right now in our country. And a central piece of this is that we, if Congress doesn't act, what that means is that we are actually living under the private government, as Professor Tijat said, the private government of these private firms uh, and the, the misapplication of law that we're seeing uh, from the courts, right? And so the essential infrastructure is exactly that. It's essential. If we don't cut, uh, update the rules of the road to make sure everybody can actually access that infrastructure, build the businesses and uh, engage in the social activities that it enables, uh, then we are not creating the kind of uh, economy that we need to be equitable and inclusive and to create new types of uh, innovation in the future. And so if I could just ask for all the witnesses, it, as I kind of reviewed both the testimony at this hearing today, which has been incredibly useful, and your written testimony, uh, it seems as if the reforms that you have all recommended or some, some part of these uh, are kind of in five different areas, and I want to be sure I haven't missed one. The first is a change of some presumptions and statutes to shift burdens to parties that both may be engaging in misconduct but also have easier access to the information. Two, this whole notion of separation of lines of business, that's sort of structural change, so we eliminate what Professor Teachout has described as this extraordinary conflict of interest, which is bad for our economy, bad for innovation, bad for a whole range of other things. Three, um, more rigorous enforcement, which of course we recognize means more resources, staff, and leadership that enthusiastically and creatively promote competition policy and believe in this stuff and will work aggressively. The fourth area is a reversal of a number of court decisions that have either kind of misinterpreted or frankly just changed the intention of Congress as it relates to important uh, competition policy. And then fifth, a set of provisions that may just explicitly prohibit discriminatory behavior. Um, so have I missed, are there other kind of other, you know, and those obviously have some permutations, but are there other general areas that we ought to be looking at in this final part of our investigation in terms of recommendation, or does that, yes, Mr. Baer? Uh, I agree with 
Um, I think that aptly summarizes the points. I do think in looking at prohibitions, we also ought to be thinking at forward-looking rules, uh, you know, interoperability, portability, as, and it may well be we need to invest, whether it's the Federal Trade Commission or a new agency with the authority to do targeted rules that actually will promote competition. So that's kind of a, yep. an addendum to point five. Great. Thank you. We'll make that point six. It deserves its own. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Cadis. Yeah, um, I just want to um, echo what, what um, okay. Bill Baer just said. I, I mean, I, I do think it's really important to think about part of what. That's why I promoted you back then. <laughs> I know. Um, right. I, too often we see when people say the world right, regulation, right, they have these, this theory of burdening commerce, where in fact regulations is just a kind of jargon way to say these are the rules of the marketplace. Right. And so the FCC, right, the reason, right, they decided at some point that a long distance monopoly didn't mean you got to have a long monopoly on phones. Right? They said, no, now you got to have interconnection. And I think a lot of the problems we're dealing with, whether, whether it be with, with any of these country, companies, is can we, better regulatory rules really will unleash competition and unleash it along the lines we want to see. And I'm just with the indulgence of my colleagues, I'm just going to ask Professor Raman, I think he had his hand up also. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Very quickly, I just add one piece, uh, which is important to clarify the rulemaking authority that the FTC will also need in order to be an effective enforcer going forward of the kinds of issues that we've talked about today. That's a dispute right now, and Congress could help uh, improve that. Well, I thank you. Um, I have gone way over my time, so I appreciate the indulgence. Um, before... Uh, closing today's hearing, though, I'd like to first um, just thank the chairman of the full committee, Chairman Nadler, who has been an extraordinary supporter of this investigation and an active participant, and it would not have been permitted to proceed in the kind of robust nature that it did without his support. So I want to thank Mr. Nadler for that. Let me, uh, let me thank uh, Mr. Cicilline for, um, for, his, for his role in this. Uh, without uh, uh, your efforts, uh, this would not have occurred. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also want to um, take a moment as a point of personal privilege to thank uh, the members of the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle who have taken this work seriously, invested extraordinary amounts of time uh, to conduct a really thorough investigation. I am really grateful for that. And also want to take a particular moment of privilege to extend my thanks to our extraordinary staff of the subcommittee for the work that they have done and will continue to do. I have said this many times before, this is a mighty staff of five or six that has done the work of 30 or more. Um, and uh, that is Slade Bond, Lena Khan, Amanda Lewis, Phil Bernbach, Anna Lenhart, and Joe Van Wy. And they have just been extraordinary. And I know all of my colleagues will join me in thanking them. Um, uh, and I think, you know, they have obviously been a really important and indispensable part of this process. And uh, every member on this dais is grateful on both sides of the aisle for all the work that's been put into it. I also want to just take a moment to thank my chief of staff, Peter Karafotis, and my communications director, Rich Lucchetti, for their diligence and commitment during this investigation. Um, and finally, to our witnesses, thank you again. You have all uh, informed this work throughout and given us a lot to think about today, and we are grateful for that. And I'll end by just reminding everyone the reason that this investigation is so important um, to the future of our country is because... Our country has a history of this battle between concentrated economic power, monopolies, and democracy. We are seeing that play out in the most extraordinary way and, frankly, in a dangerous way. And it's incumbent on the Congress of the United States to fulfill our responsibility to make sure our economy works and we safeguard our democracy. And uh, this investigation is a critical part of that. So thank you all. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Men I'm sorry, members have five legislative days to enter into the record materials and extended remarks.